must restore that which was separated. Welcome to the ultimate guide to the Aether storyline. This video will include all of the necessary information to understand the story and its connections it has with the campaign, so that you can understand the story in time for Black Ops Cold War Zombies. While focusing on the zombies aspects, various events from the campaign will be included in this timeline, as this connection is key to understanding whatever comes next. There is an easter egg hidden somewhere in this video, make sure to watch the full 2 hours and comment down below if you find it. In the beginning, there was only the first one and the ether. In this infinite and timeless space, the first one crafts the first creation, known as the Astoth Abzarach, or All Key in his language, later known as the Summoning Key, and uses it to create all of the dimensions, giving each a unique mix of life. Amongst this creation of the dimensions, the first one creates beings like himself, though still within the ether. He then forms one final dimension, so that he and his kin may inhabit it. Agatha. This serves as a physical manifestation of the ether. The first one disappears for unknown reasons and two beings equally powerful as one another emerge. They would be referred to by many names by the different cultures that learned of them, but eventually as Dr. Monty and the Shadow Man. The first race begins experimenting, creating the first matter transference device. The group under the Shadow Man begin more intense experimentation and create the ether pyramid, a device that gives the user the same ultimate power that can be obtained from the summoning key. The group under Dr. Monty saw this as a chaotic disruption in his perfect order. Believing the other group to have been corrupted by the dark power held within the ether, they were cast down, starting a civil war among the first race. The Shadow Man's group knew they would be beaten and so hide the ether pyramid on the moon of a planet where intelligent life had begun to develop. As well as sending element 115 to this planet in the hopes that this life would eventually use the element to open a gateway to Agatha located there. The group under Monty finally beat their enemies and banished them into the Dark Aether. They now believe they are the keepers of order within the dimensions, and begin viewing themselves as such. Their language becomes far more logical as their own culture evolves, and they become far more humanoid in appearance as their biology similarly evolves. The group under the Shadow Man become ever more twisted by the Dark Aether, losing their free will and becoming in a hive mind, though interestingly they maintain their original language. For eons they remain corrupting within the dark ether, waiting for their opportunity to return and retake what they believe was stolen from them. An easy way to understand Agatha, the ether and the dark ether is in simple terms. Agatha is the light version of reality, the place above creation, where Dr. Monty and the Keepers reside as they see themselves as the protectors of reality. The ether is all of reality, the entire multiverse, the middle of creation. The dark ether is the shadow, the dark version of reality, below creation, corrupted and damned to eternal suffering. This is where the Apothecans were banished. A good way to visualise this in layman's terms, although not accurate, is that the perfect world, Agatha, can be represented as heaven. The ether is earth, the universe and all of its inhabitants, all possessing ethereal energy. The more that one may time travel, the more ethereal energy they may accumulate, causing severe fractures and fragments crumbling through the ether. And the dark ether can be seen as hell. We actually see the dark ether in a visual format for the very first time in the Dear Machina trailer, where, like I just stated, the dark ether is simply a demented version of reality. The map seems to be exactly the same, however, 
It's tormented, forever changed and corrupted. The Keepers are described as angels by Samantha, whilst the Shadow Man is seen as the devil on Mob of the Dead. While that is not an entirely accurate representation of them, that is how a lot of humans may perceive this. Maybe this idea is what spawned religion in the first place. After all, Agatha is referred to as Revelations. It is simultaneously the start and end of creation. We have light and we have a darkness. We have Dr. Monty and we have the Shadow Man. However, the lines are blurred between light and darkness, good and evil. Neither Dr. Monty nor the Shadow Man are good or evil. Neither can be defined as a light or darkness, but together they can be defined as light and darkness. As Monty described on Revelations, they are two parts of the same worm, but which one is the arse? Although somewhat different from one another, they lack defining features. Monty and the Shadow Man are more similar than you know. Both were corrupted by the Dark Aether. The Shadow Man by his own ambition. Monty by desperately trying to save his friend, the Shadow Man. Both never wanted to be ripped apart by the Dark Aether and craved to be won again by resolving their duality. On September 3rd, 5 AD, the Apothecans begin to plan for a war they know they cannot win. Element 115 is sent to the Earth in the hopes that humanity will eventually wage war on themselves with it, and either accidentally through the war or purposefully, out of hubris, open a gateway to Agatha and release the Apothecans. On January the 15th, 1292, the Great War kicks off. Humanity begins a battle that would last years to come. On April 14th, 1294, a knight known as Pablo Pablo Marinus is nearing death in the clutches of a magua, when at the last second a group of four men with magical staffs slay the beast and save his life. This is Primus's eleventh and final encounter, when the cycle repeats itself on Revelations. All encounters of Ultimus, Primus and Victus will be labelled in order from their perspective within this video. Due to the effects of time travel, their appearances do not happen in order in this timeline, so this will help to keep track of their adventures. On December 31st, 1299, now with the help and guiding hands of Primus and the Keepers, humanity is able to defeat and seal away the Apothecans once again. During the end of the Great War, Richtofen comes to a realisation about the nature of reality and the cycle he and the rest of existence are trapped in. By coming to the Great War and once again defeating the Apothecans, Primus has sealed the fate of themselves and the universe in the cycle. Dr. Monty had duped them, and Richtofen laments this fact to Pablo. As the two men become friends, Richtofen shares more with Pablo, stating that he believes Monty is not evil, but simply chooses this cycle to protect himself and the ether. Upon hearing this, Pablo suggests that if they are doomed to return to this point over and over, eventually there is something they can change. Richtofen hatches a plan, and with his dying act, Pablo protects him long enough to power on an ancient teleportation device and sends himself to the future, where he will be cryogenically frozen along with the gem from the fire staff to wait for the mobsters to break their cycle. On January 1st, 1300, as their last recorded act in history before never to be seen again, Primus instructs the Wolf King to build the castle of Der Eisendrache. On June 4th, in northern France, a tomb is constructed to honour the fallen soldiers of the Great War within it. Statues of Primus are constructed to symbolise the hope that if one day a great evil falls upon mankind, they may return. On September September 19, 1318, upon his death, the Wolf King specifically requests his bones to be scattered around Der Eisendrache to pay respect to him. Arthur, his loyal servant, accompanied by his wolf, walks the grounds and scatters his bones. On September 20th, the next day after scattering his master's bones, Arthur is pulled through a temporal rift to Angola in 2025, to a prison cell in an underground western town brought there through time as well. Sometime before April 14th, 1855, a blacksmith named Jeb Brown accompanies his mother to the old western town of Purgatory Point. They live there in relative peace until a man named Clive Farnsworth enters the town mine and later exits as a zombie, killing Jebediah's mother. On April 14th, 1885, tortured by how this could have happened to his mother, Jeb Brown enters the town mine to figure out what happened to Clive. He does not exit for five days, even though to him it felt like mere minutes. On April 19th, 
two creatures from somewhere unknown to the blacksmith come down and speak to Jeb. He dubs them angels and they give him the plans to construct a magical machine called the Pack-a-Punch. On April 30th, the angels return and ask Jeb Brown to create the Agathan device. Jeb is unable to require two of the ingredients that they ask for, an elemental shard as he has no way to control souls to infuse them into element 115 and also apothecum blood as he has no way to travel to the bottom of the ocean and retrieve it. Jeb instead creates the only piece he had the ability to, a golden winding artifact that would come to be called the Seal of Duality. On July 3rd, Jeb Brown designs a similar device to the Seal of Duality but far less powerful, the Vril device. On July 20th, depressed due to the death of his mother and desperate to return her to him, Jeb digs up her body and places it into the Pack-a-Punch machine. When she returns, she is neither alive nor dead, and instead becomes a ghost permanently bound to haunt Purgatory Point. On July 21st, the angels return to Jeb Brown and ask him to place the golden device he created into the Pack-a-Punch machine to upgrade it. On July 22nd, Jeb Brown obeys the orders from the angels and places the device into the Pack-a-Punch. The entire town of Purgatory Point is ripped from time and teleported underground to Angola. In 2025, where what's left of the townsfolk are quickly overrun by the undead. On June 30th, 1908, near the stony Tunguska River, a meteorite crashes which contains large amounts of element 115. Odds are one of the rocks shot through a portal at the beginning of Revelations. On August 30th, 1925, Ultimus, Dr. Edward Richthofen joins the Illuminati. On February 4th, 1931, an incredibly large amount of 115 is discovered in a salt mine near Breslau, Germany. A German scientist named Dr. Ludwig Maxis is sent to investigate. On May 10th, 1931, after spending some time with the new element, Maxis forms Group 935, an international organization dedicated to the study of Element 115. Maxis says they will abandon their respective governments and work in secret to improve the human condition using this element. On November 5th, 1934, Samantha Maxis is born. Her mother dies in childbirth. On August 11th, 1936, Maxis gives Richthofen an invitation to Group 935. Richthofen, hoping to infiltrate them for the Illuminati, agrees. On April 10th, 1937, the Imperial Japanese Army discovers Element 115 meteor fragments in a swamp within Japanese territory. They build the Rising Sun facility to continue research. Division 9 is created to oversee its operation. On June 14th, the United States government discovers deposits of Element 115 in Groom Lake. On March 12th, 1938, Nazi Germany annexes Austria. On July 2nd, 1939, Maxis and Richthofen begin teleportation experiments with the matter transference prototype to mild success. The subjects are teleported, but their chemical composition is altered, leaving them catatonic and changed. Maxis would later secretly inscribe on the device 2M, who started me on this journey. On August 8th, 1939, Maxis and Richthofen discover 115 can be used to reanimate the dead. However, the reanimated subjects are not receptive to commands. On September 1st, Germany invades Poland, sparking World War II. On September 3rd, Richthofen produces the prototype for the Wunderwaff DG series, the DG-1 or Scharfschutze. On November 23rd, Maxis contacts the Reichstag and informs them that with funding, they will be able to mass produce weapons ranging from energy rifles, undead hordes, super soldatin and mechanical giants. On December 4th, during test trial 151, Richthofen and Dr. Schuster successfully teleport a walnut. This is the first successful test where the chemical composition of the object is maintained throughout the process. On December 5th, Edward's walnut delivery fails to impress Maxis, who declares it a waste of time. He reveals to Richthofen that Group 935 will soon be funded by the Nazi regime. Richthofen worries that this will lead to massive defections as 935 is an international group. He and Schuster decide to continue their teleportation experiments behind Maxis's back. On January 4th, 1940, Richthofen and Schuster conduct their first human teleportation test. Richthofen is so confident in its success, he volunteers himself. Teleported to the moon, he encounters the Ether Pyramid, hidden by the Apothecans, later labelled the Moon Pyramid Device, or MPD. While inspecting the device, Richthofen is electrocuted and begins hearing the many voices of the sealed Apothecans, including that of the Shadow Man. The device then teleports him to Shangri-La, corrupted by the Dark Aether, Richthofen is 
gradually being driven insane by an obsession to find Agatha. On January 5th, Richtofen is worshipped by the natives of Shangri-La. An altar is built in his name. Richtofen encounters the focusing stone for the first time. On January 23rd, after a near-month absence, Richtofen returns to Schuster with a plan to build Griffin Station. On January 24th, Richtofen renounces his involvement with the Illuminati, as he now believes he had no further need for them. When asked how he could abandon his obligation to the Order, he says, Teddy was a liar. On March 13th, construction of Griffin Station on the moon begins. Frustrated with Maxis' alignment with Germany, other disgruntled Group 935 scientists join the cause, including Dr. Groff. On July 13th, Maxis instructs his assistant and lover, Sophia, to write a letter to the Reichstag, High Command requesting additional funds. Whilst confident in the mass production of the DG2 and bluffing about the success of the Undead Army, he admits the funding shortages have proven detrimental to the Giants project. On August 1st, in response to Maxis's request, Germany creates two new facilities for Group 935. They are the Kino Facility, a repurposed theatre, and the Asylum Facility at the Wittenau Senatorium, both in Berlin. On August 18th, as per Germany's request, the Japanese Imperial Army hands over the Rising Sun facility to Group 935. Division 9 remains involved on the site. October 3rd, Group 935 establishes a research facility in Siberia near the Tunguska River. It is here that the Super Soldaten cloning program would occur. On November 6th, Group 935 establishes a research facility at Griffin Castle, Austria, codenamed the Eagle's Nest or the Iron Dragon, aka Der Eisendracher. This facility would serve as a test site for the V2 rocket, as well as general holding for prisoners. On June 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa begins. Germany begins to take over the Soviet Union. On June 24th, Nikolai Belensky's wife is killed during the German advance into the Soviet Union. In an effort to numb the pain, Nikolai increasingly turns to vodka. On December 7th, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and the United States joins World War II. On January 11th, 1942, Maxis gives Fluffy to Samantha. The dog is expecting a litter. On January 20th, Maxis tests the first file for storage on the data servant. On January 26th, on the data servant, Maxis catalogues locations with prominent Element 115 deposits. He includes information about its various applications and cites that the reanimation of dead cells is a possible side effect. On January 30th, Richtofen completes the Wunderwaffe DG2 prototype. On February 1st, with Griffin Station completed, Richtofen names Dr. Groff, lead scientist and returns to Earth to continue the charade with Maxis. Working alongside Schuster, Groff is left to discover how to power the MPD. On February 2nd, in a speech to his staff, Groff talks optimistically about Griffin Station's establishment as a permanent base of operations. On April 17th, Maxis develops the ray gun prototype at the Rising Sun facility. Dr. H. Porter works on developing the second generation model. On May 15th, Group 935 recovers a variety of artifacts from a buried American western town found in Angola, including the original golden pack-a-punch machine, the Vril device, and the Vril vessel, or Seal of Duality, all built by Jeb Brown under guidance from quote-unquote the Angels. On June 13th, the OSS precursor to the CIA forms in the United States. Also on June 13th, a result of temporal shifts in 1963's Kino, Monty reaches across time and offers little nudges. One nudge is developing Group 935's Element 115 fused elixirs. They create four medicinal beverages known colloquially as Juggernog, Quick Revive, Speed Cola and Double Tap. On June 28th, Dr. H. Porter takes charge of the weapons upgrade program and successfully reverse engineers and recreates Jeb Brown's Pack-a-Bunch machine, though it is more inefficient than its predecessors. On July 18th, Groff and Schuster unwittingly discover how to charge the MPD when Schuster kills a rat near the device. Its life force or soul is transferred into the device. These findings are reported to Richtofen. On July 20th, Richtofen begins sending soldiers and scientists to the moon to be sacrificed as their souls would be used to charge the MPD. On August 17th, 1942, aka Semper Fi, Sergeant Sullivan and Corporal Roebuck rescue Private Miller from Japanese imprisonment on the Mackin Atoll before destroying a bunker there and escaping. On September 17th, aka Vendetta, Sergeant Victor Reznov and Private Dmitry Petrenko survive a massacre in Stalingrad. As an act of revenge, they assassinate General Heinrich 
Village, Amzul, and regroup with Red Army forces. On November 5th, Takio Masaki is dispatched by the Emperor to oversee the work of Group 935 and Division 9 at the Rising Sun facility. On December 8th, Richthofen shares the Element 115 based elixir recipes with Griffin Station. They develop a mule kick. On December 9th, Nikolai's brother is killed during the Battle of Stalingrad. On December 14th, Richthofen creates the Monkey Bomb. On December 16th, in a personal log, Maxis expresses concern over Element 115's impact on Richthofen's behaviour. No longer trusting him, he wonders if it was a mistake to invite him to Group 935. On December 20th, accompanied by Sophia, Maxis is transferred to the Kino facility to focus on creating Germany's undead army. Samantha is left in Richthofen's care. Sometime in January 1943, Dr. Friedrich Steiner begins developing Nova 6. Later in 1943, on January 8th, Maxis worries he and Sophia have grown too close. He considers sending her away. On January 16th, Nikolai is captured by German forces during the Battle of Stalingrad. He becomes the first subject inducted into the Super Soldaten clone program. On January 27th, Maxis reports success with Subject 26, whose violent outbursts have been greatly reduced. Via the use of mind control techniques pioneered from Group 601, Maxis believes this method of treatment will be 100% efficient in most cases. On February 2nd, the Battle of Stalingrad ends. On February 10th, Maxis reports the treatment has been perfected. He believes if Subject 26 retain the impressions longer than 26 hours, then the delivery of these zombie armory can be accelerated. On February 12th, after attacking a handler, Subject 26 is killed and deemed another setback. On May 18th, Harvey Yina, a spy for the OSS, begins his work with Group 935. On June 15th, Takio reports to the Emperor that the work being done at the Rising Sun facility is unacceptable. On July 24th, viewing Takio Masaki as a beacon of the old ways of honour and a threat to his rule, the Emperor has him taken prisoner by Division 9. Later being transferred to Group 935, he becomes the second subject inducted into the Super Soldaten cloning program. On July 14th, 1944, after the setbacks with Subject 26, Maxis reports new success with the Undead Army. However, he maintains his belief that the Undead cannot be contained or maintained. The idea sparks Maxis's desire to find what he called the Genesis Code, a method of reanimating not just the body, but the mind and soul as well. On September the 2nd, a Mexican spy is captured by Group 935 at Der Eisendracher. After initial 115 experimentation, he would write that he believes his name is Pablo Marinas, and he is a knight from a great war centuries ago. He would later become the third subject inducted into the Super Soldaten cloning program. On September 5th, an internal memo at the GK company shares details on Project Nova's trials as they test dispersion methods, and it is suggested that tests be performed on human subjects. The memo is eventually recovered by the CIA and translated on March 3rd, 19 on September 15th, 1944, the Battle of Pelaliu begins, Tag Dempsey among the fighting force. On September 15th, 1944, aka Little Resistance, Sergeant Sullivan leads a team to storm the beaches of Pelaliu and he is killed during the battle. Roebuck is promoted and becomes the squad leader. Later, on September 15th, aka Hard Landing, Sergeant Roebuck, along with Private Miller and Private Polonsky, completes the mission to capture a Japanese airfield. Later that day, Burnham Out begins. Sergeant Roebuck, Private Miller and Private Plonsky advance further into Peleliu, wiping out three Japanese mortar pits. The next day on September 16th, Relentless takes place. Sergeants Roebuck, Private Miller and Private Plonsky are tasked with destroying artillery positions at the point, allowing American forces to take the island. On April 3rd, Black Cats takes place. Two PBY Catalina planes attack Japanese merchant ships heading for Okinawa before receiving a distress call from an American fleet hit by a kamikaze attack. They fight off Japanese boats and Zeros while rescuing survivors. Not long later, on April 16th, their land, their blood occurs. Private Petrenko is saved from German capture at Silo Heights and advances with Sergeant Reznov and Private Chernov to take a German encampment. Later that day, Private Petrenko controls a tank assisting in the capture of Silo Heights. This is blood and iron. Later that day, the Battle of Berlin begins. After this, on April 23rd, Ring of Steel begins. Sergeants Reznov, Private Petrenko, and Private Chernov advance into Berlin as German forces retreat. On April 24th, eviction begins. Sergeants Reznov, 
Chernov, Private Petrenko and Private Chernov advance further into Berlin. Chernov is disgusted by the wanton killing of surrendering Germans as they fight in a subway. The Germans flood the area out of desperation. On April 30th, Heart of the Reich takes place. Sergeants Reznov, Private Petrenko and Private Chernov advance towards the Reichstag. Chernov is killed in action. Later that day, a downfall takes place. Sergeants Reznov and Private Petrenko capture the Reichstag, planting the flag of the Soviet Union on its rooftop. On this very day, Adolf Hitler commits suicide. On May 7th, Germany surrenders and the war in Europe ends. Group 935 continues to operate within their borders, with surviving Nazi factions still encouraging them to continue their work in a vain attempt to reclaim Germany. The main focus of this would become the Super Soldaten cloning program. On May 9th, in his cell, Pablo writes the visions of a great war. He describes a great battle against strange demon-like creatures who were trying to devour the earth. In his vision, he sees four knights protect him from certain death. He makes a note that the knights wore tunics similar to those seen in Der Eisendrache. On May 14th, Blowtorch and Corkscrew takes place. Sergeants Roebuck, Private Miller and Private Polunsky invade a fortress in Okinawa, destroying several bunkers. On May 29th, Breaking Point takes place. Sergeants Roebuck, Private Miller and Private Polunsky invade Shuri Castle in Okinawa. Private Polunsky dies and Sergeant Roebuck lives. On June 4th, Nagda Untoten takes place. An allied plane malfunctions over an airfield and crashes. German army trucks transporting the undead and Element 115 between Group 935 facilities are struck in the crash. The Marines surviving the crash hold out against the undead as long as they can. On June 17th, Peter McCain, a former Marine and OSS agent, infiltrates Group 935 at Der Rees. On June 29th, Groff and Schuster develop the wave gun. On July 15th, Richthofen travels to the Siberian facility to head up the Super Soldaten cloning project. As her temporary guardian, he takes Samantha with him. Group 935 begins transferring three test subjects for experimentations, Nikolai, Pablo and Takio. On July 18th, per the orders of a quote-unquote Mr. Wrapped, an American reporter charts a course to specific coordinates. Unbeknownst to him, these are that of the Siberian facility. In search of an artifact called the Seal of Duality, being confronted by Richthofen, he realises he is likely facing his own death and informs Edward that no matter the dimension, Mr. Rapt will find a new version of him to carry on pursuing these artifacts. Richthofen has the man killed. On July 29th, while Richthofen works at the Siberian facility, Group 935 begins development of Deadshot Daiquiri. Sometime later this year in 1945, in August, Edward Richthofen contacts the United States and the Soviet Union separately, offering them Group 935's research and scientists. On August 1st, the Russian, Japanese and Mexican subjects arrive at the Siberian facility, due to become the primary test subjects of the Super Soldaten cloning program. On August 28th, Richthofen creates a log entry detailing work on the Super Soldat program. He returns to schematics taken from Jeb Brown and starts work on investigating the so-called Agathon device and notes its three components, the Vril Vessel or Seal of Duality, the Blood of an Apothecan Overlord and the Elemental Shard. On August 31st, OSS handler Cornelius Purnell confirms that Peter McCain has successfully infiltrated Group 935 and has been transferred to the asylum facility. Cornelius suspects Group 935 is losing control of their experiments and has sent in a marine recon unit to extract McCain. Tang Dempsey is to lead of the squad. On September 1st, Peter is outed as a spy and captured by Group 935. On September 2nd, Richthofen reports Pablo has died following a spleen removal. Unbeknownst to him, this was an intentional sabotage by Harvey Yena in an effort to coax out information pertaining to the elemental shard. He also reveals he's been performing experiments on Samantha. On the same day, September 2nd, World War II ends, Group 935 continues their research. Later, the same day, temporal rifts begin to affect the asylum facility. An orderly reports increasing problems with test subjects. Many in the facility have begun hearing voices coming from the walls, including the sobbing of a boy and a girl screaming and a man shouting for children to close the windows. The next day, September the 3rd, an undead outbreak occurs at the asylum facility. Peter McCain escapes. On September 6th, Verrucht takes place. Dempsey, John Banana, Smokey and Paxton Gunner Ridge arrive at the asylum facility to find it overrun by zombies. They fight off the horde as long as they can. Dempsey is apprehended by Group 
1935, Gooder manages to escape alive. The following day, September 7th, John Banana writes messages and records his last words while being eaten alive by an undead Smokey. These would later be logged and stored on the top secret Dreamland server. On September 10th, Richtofen reports another spy has been captured and will be brought in to replace the Mexican. The subject is Dempsey. On September 13th, Cornelius Purnell attempts to send a transmission to Peter McCain, telling him to rendezvous at the Rising Sun facility. On September 17th, Dempsey arrives at the Siberian facility. The three subjects are cloned and murdered relentlessly in an attempt to make the perfect soldier. Many of these iterations resulted in abhorrent mutations. Note, it is unknown whether Ultimus Dempsey, Nikolai and Takio are the original subjects or the final clones. On September 20th, Richtofen documents the personality traits of his test subjects. Dempsey's intellect seems low but his will is strong. Takio is still staring at the floor, muttering what sounds like some kind of proverb over and over again. Nikolai has recently begun responding to stimuli, but only after injections of a new serum made primarily from vodka. Richtofen notes that their minds have been almost entirely broken, with no memory remaining of who they once were. He also reveals his suspicions of Dr. Yina and Dr. McCain, as the news of McCain's capture had yet to reach the Siberian facility. Using Element 115 and the Seal of Duality, Richtofen binds the souls of both himself and his three test subjects to a rock of element 115, this causing the rock to shift and change into a translucent shard of pure crystalline 115, the elemental shard. Richtofen notes that this crystal is seemingly capable of infinite energy. Unbeknownst to him, this is because the shard is a physical manifestation of the entire ether, and as a result of using their souls, Edward and his subjects were now intrinsically linked to one another and the ether itself. No matter the dimension. Shortly after, Yina reports this to Dr. Maxis. On September 24th, Maxis returns to the Durys facility. He orders Richtofen to do likewise so they may continue their work on the matter transference device. He also orders the elemental shard to be sent to Division 9 and reveals he has cancelled mass production of the DG2 as retribution for Richtofen's use of 935 funding for personal endeavours. Hypocritically, however, Maxis has been researching the Viril in his spare time just as Richtofen had. Though unknown to Maxis, the shard he had just sent away was, in fact, the key to the Genesis code. On September 27th, Richtofen returns to Deriz with Dempsey, Nikolai Takio, and Samantha. On October 1st, Maxis reports on Richtofen's findings with his Super Soldatan test subjects, noting that while their baseline psyche remains intact, all specific memories have been lost. Later that day, on October 1st, infuriated to learn that Maxis has not been mass producing the DG2 as he swore he would. Wood, Richtofen reveals in his plot to destroy Maxis and Samantha, vowing that he will no longer continue to work on his undead army. On October 8th, Groff reports to Richtofen that the MPD is nearly ready. On October 10th, Richtofen informs Schuster of his deal with the Americans and the Soviets in order to secure the required pieces for his grand scheme. Richtofen contacted both the USA and USSR in exchange for Group 935 scientists and resources. Richtofen would request certain items. Items. Of note, these were a polarization device to be built in Hanford, Washington, and a lunar lander to be stashed in the abandoned theater facility in East Berlin, now under Soviet control. On October 12th, Groff radios Richtofen to inform him that the device has been powered up and is awaiting the conduit. Richtofen says he will proceed with Operation Shield and dispose of Maxis and Samantha. The following day on October 13th, though frustrated that the matter transference tests have been largely unsuccessful, Maxis acknowledges that the test subjects' departure from their original point of origin is undeniable. However, Richtofen's suggestion that the subjects have been transported not through space, but time itself causes Maxis to worry if his irrationality may soon prove a liability to our endeavours. Later that day on October 13th, Maxis and Richtofen performed teleportation test trials on the test subjects numbers 3, 4 and 5. All fail, including test 5, where Maxis uses Fluffy as Test 6 fails, Fluffy, now changed, is teleported back into the chamber. Samantha sees Fluffy and runs into the teleporter. Maxis chases after her. Richtofen seals them both in the test chamber and teleports all three of them. Samantha is then teleported to the moon while Groff and Schuster work on the MPD. Running into the MPD, she is drawn inside of it, where she becomes corrupted by the Dark Aether. Maxis is teleported to the crazy place and develops the power to merge with electricity. Richtofen returns to the moon, 
that learning Samantha is trapped in the MPD, he orders Groff to teleport Maxis there to coax her out of the device. He also warns Groff to keep an eye out for an evil looking dog. This is the origin of the Hellhounds. Later, in an effort to free Samantha, Maxis approaches the MPD and persuades her to come out. Once she does, Maxis gives her an instruction to kill them all. Maxis kills himself and merges with the technology of Griffin Station, while Samantha unleashes the undead upon the base. The next day on October 14th, H. Porter activates the alarm as an outbreak occurs at Der Rees. Before taking a cyanide capsule, he says he's all out of hope, God forgive us all. Later that day, Richtofen returns to Der Rees and awakens Dempsey, Takio and Nikolai. With no recollection of who they are or who Richtofen is, they agree to help him. The four would later be known as Ultimus. On October 18th, Peter McCain parachutes over the Rising Sun facility. He dies shortly after. On October 21st, Shino Numa takes place. Ultimus's first mission. Ultimus travels to the Rising Sun facility to recover Richthofen's journal, which details everything from his decoding of the Apothecan and Keeper languages, to his plans for the Agathan device, to his detailing of the MPD and much more. Upon reading it, Richthofen begins to form his plan to defeat Samantha. On October 28th, Der Rees, aka Ultimus's second mission takes place. Ultimus returns to Der Rees. With his diary, Richthofen plans to use the teleporter to return to the moon and confront Samantha. The Wunderwaff DG2 overloads the teleporter and sends them through time, with Richthofen dropping his diary. On October 29th, Project Nova takes place. Friedrich Steiner and other members of the German Wunderwaff program flee to the Arctic Circle. Steiner defects to the Soviets, showing them the location of a crashed ship containing samples of Nova 6. British commandos attempt to capture the Nova 6 as Steiner escapes with the Soviets. The betrayed Victor Reznov destroys the ship and Nova 6 present inside. Steiner and the other scientists are recovered near the Arctic Circle, along with former members of Group 935, who would go on to become a part of the Ascension Group. On November 5th, Group 935 is disbanded. The following year, on January 19th, 1946, the United States and the Soviet Union share the resources recovered from Group 935's various research stations. Richthofen's diary is among the items recovered by the Soviet Union. The United States and the Soviet Union, both being promised assets and scientists by Richthofen, begin moving in on 935 facilities in order to claim them. With this coming to a head at Der Rees, where a standoff between the two forces resulted in a massacre at the facility. Pavel Gorky, founder of GK Medical and cousin to Lev Kravchenko, is among the Red Army detachment. In the wake of this massacre, the Soviet Union was able to recover Richthofen's journal, still lying on the floor. Later that month, on January 20th, Major George Sawyer reports the successful extraction of 40 scientists from Group 935 during talks with the Soviet Union. On January 27th, the Pentagon hires many former Group 935 scientists in an effort to replicate their work through Operation Stapler. On January 29th, as with their US counterparts, the Soviets hire many former Group 935 scientists. Among them is Harvey Yena, who forms the Ascension Group, along with Anton Gersh and Friedrich Steiner, with Nikita Dragovich, serving as the group's military representative. Unbeknownst to Moscow, Yena was very much still working for the US and could not refuse the opportunity to become a founding member of the future of Russian science. On February 2nd, Pablo Marinas begins broadcasting a signal from the Siberian facility in the hopes of rescue. This would eventually result in the crashing of the Tungarin. On March 23rd, Richthofen's demands from Operation Stapler are filed. They include a portrait of Richthofen in the Pentagon, a polarization device to be built in Hanford, and $20 in change. The following year, on March 12th, 1947, President Truman announces the Truman Doctrine in an attempt to halt communist influence in Europe, beginning a Cold War. Later that year, from June to July, an unidentified flying object's remains are found in Roswell, New Mexico, which are recovered by the military. Shortly after, President Truman would establish the Majestic 12, an organization made up of scientists with the intent of investigating UFO activity. Members had access to the top secret Dreamland server and included Vannevar Bush, J. Robert Oppenheimer, Albert Einstein, and Werner von Braun. On June 27th, Dr. Schuster makes a personal log regarding his new position in the Pentagon. The Americans continue to push him towards trying to control the undead, and he informs them of Samantha's existence 
and the downfall of Griffin Station. On August 8th, while logging materials recovered from Group 935, Schuster discovers Maxis's original matter transference prototype. Scratched into the bottom, it reads, For M, who started me on this journey. On September 18th, the CIA forms in the United States. The following year, August 12th, 1948, junior analyst Ryan Jackson sends a memorandum to senior analyst John Abrams regarding the German Wunderwaffe program. He recommends looking further into the Uranium Club, rocket and aircraft research, and the rumoured Diglock device. The following year, on December 2nd, 1949, the Green Run begins at the Hanford site in Washington, where a large amount of radioactive products are released on a populated area. On July 29th, 1952, the Pentagon begins experiments involving their own versions of the undead. On April 13th, 1953, Project MK Ultra begins. Later that year, on June 9th, a memorandum of Project MK Ultra Sub Project 8 is written up. Research on the effects of LSD will be conducted secretly on unsuspecting hospital patients until the end of the period. September 11th, 1954. On that date, a document of hypnotic suggestion is written up, including an experiment with Miss Doe, who was hypnotized into attempting to awaken Miss Smith, and after failure to awaken, Miss Doe would shoot Miss Smith with an unloaded revolver and then fall asleep. On July 14th, later that year, the Dreamland administration sends mail to all users on the CIA mail server, informing them that the Dreamland server is for Majestic 12 members only. The following year, in 1955, on May 12th, the US government transfers a number of Element 115 experiments to the Green Lake facility. Later that year, October 5th, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer discovers a limerick left behind at Verruckt by John Banana, sharing it with Dr. V. Bush. Bush shares another back. On October 19th, Gersh and Yuri Zafoyski begin working for the Ascension Group. On October 24th, Dr. V. Bush shares two more John Banana limericks found at Verrucht. He notes that John Banana may have been trying to tell the reader something. He notes the letters DK-MKF. Unbeknownst to both men, this was somehow the login information for D. King, the suspicious chief staffer of the CIA. As if the 115 induced delusions experienced by John allowed him to learn that Bush and Oppenheimer would read his message and so he attempted to warn them. On October 31st, Dr. V. Bush shares translated files from the Dury's data servants written by Dr. Maxis with Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. The same year, in 1955, on November 1st, the Vietnam War begins. The following year, 1956, on January 1st, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer sends Dr. V. Bush his encrypted password for the Dreamland server. As his security clearance and files are being revoked due to his out spoken support for international control of nuclear power. On April 25th, Shangri-La takes place and is Ultimus's sixth adventure. Explorers Brock and Gary discover Shangri-La. During an eclipse, they're unwittingly trapped in a time loop. Sally, sent back in time from 2011, is trapped in the same loop. Ultimus arrives in Shangri-La with the help of Brock and Gary. They acquire the Focusing Stone. Dempsey accidentally fires the Baby Maker or 3179 JGB215. While attempting to teleport to Griffin Station, sending Ultimus to the Pentagon in 1963. The following year, 1957, on July 18th, American operatives discover that the Ascension Group has been successfully matter transference testing with a working teleporter. They also discover that Richthofen made a deal with the Soviets in 1945 to give up Group 935 research and scientists in exchange for his demands. On August 6th, Pablo begins he must help Richthofen in ending the cycle using the Agathon device advice and return to the Great War. Sometime later, his transmissions reach the Ascension Group and he requests the Apothecan Blood to craft the device. The following year, January 1958, Mao Zedong unveils his Great Leap Forward plan which lasted until 1961. Sometime during this year, 1958, the Ascension Group receives a transmission from Pablo Marinas, instructing them to find the Apothecan Blood in order to build the Agathon device. Harvey Yina puts together a team to extract the blood at the specified coordinates in the Pacific Ocean. Shortly after recovering the blood, Dr. Gersh convinces Dr. Yina that the Ascension Group should study the blood rather than deliver it to Pablo. Sometime between then, 1958 and December 12th, 1962, the Ascension Group discovers that the Apothecan blood is made up of millions of microscopic organisms which use negative space for energy. Further research would be performed on primates for rocket testing, giving them rejuvenation ability 
1970s, Gersh has the idea to apply the concept of negative space towards what would later become known as Project Mercury. On February 16th, 1959, Fidel Castro is sworn in as the Prime Minister of Cuba. Later that year, June 3rd, the Pentagon constructs their own prototype teleporter and commences experimentation. On August 12th, Chief Analyst Ryan Jackson sends a memo to the Chief of the Western Hemisphere Division of the CIA, JC King, with information on a program of covert action against the Castro regime. Operation 40 will be created in an attempt to cope against Castro to deter any future communist regimes in Latin America. The following year, October 5th, 1960, Ryan Jackson sends a memo to Richard Kane informing him of suspicious activity in Cuba that suggests Soviet involvement. The following year, January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy is inaugurated as the President of the United States. The next day, January 21st, Robert McNamara becomes the Secretary of Defense. A couple months later, on March 5th, Ryan Jackson writes up a profile on Grigory Weaver, a Russian-born deep cover agent. On March 11th, Cornelius Pinnell reports Secretary McNamara's lack of interest in combining the Pentagon's resources with Green Lake to create Broken Arrow. On March 15th, Exposed Magazine puts out an issue on the topic of the space race and the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union as the attempt to send the first person to space. On April 12th, Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human to be sent to space. On April 13th, Alex Mason is given a pre-op psychological evaluation. On April 17th, Richard Kane informs John F. Kennedy that Operation 40 has made contact with their informant in Santa Maria. On April 17th, Operation 40 takes place. Black Ops agents participating in the Bay of Pigs invasion attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro. Alex Mason is captured and sent to Varkuta. On April 19th, the Bay of Pigs invasion fails. On June 4th, a teleporter link is successfully established between the Pentagon and Groom Lake, using Dr. Schuster's signal amplifier. Work begins on a link between Groom Lake and Griffin Station. On July 11th, upon examining materials recovered from Division 9 in 1946, Colonel Sawyer discovers that an elemental shard has gone missing. He has his suspicions that Cornelius Pennell is involved. On July 21st, the White House sends out a memo warning of recent transmissions from a suspected numbers station regarding research with Tabun, Sarin, Somon, and an unknown gas. In addition, transmissions regarding plutonium and uranium were also intercepted. On October 30th, the most powerful atomic weapon ever created, the Tsar bomb, is detonated off the coast of Nova Yerzemlya, island by the Kravchenko. On November 24th, Ryan Jackson recommends a covert operation at Bakanur Cosmodrome after the recent detonation of the Tsar bomb and the failed coup in Cuba. On January 8th, the following year, 1962, Ryan Jackson documents statements from a former Vokuta inmate, Captain Anthony Rizzo, and determines the likelihood of Mason's survival at Vokuta to be minuscule. On February 24th, Ryan Jackson creates a profile on Jason Hudson. On March 15th, studying Group 935's medicinal elixir research, the Ascension Group develops PhD flopper and stamina. On July 7th, Exposed Magazine creates an issue about a silverback gorilla sent into space by the Soviet Union that returned as a zombie. On May 11th, Cornelius Pennell is ordered to begin construction of the APD at Camp Edward, with plans to recover the Vril device and Vril Sophia from Griffin Station. On September 22nd, John F. Kennedy thanks John McCone for his report on an issue in Cuba. He will begin an investigation. On October 6th, a shortwave radio transmission from Havana, Cuba is intercepted by American air traffic controllers. The transmission contains a female voice reading off a set of numbers. On October 7th, John McCone delivers an analysis of the suspicious Soviet missile activity in Cuba to John F. Kennedy. On October 10th, Ryan Jackson writes a memo concerning an influx in Soviet spy vessels in the Caribbean coinciding with increased numbers station traffic. On October 15th, the CIA identifies ballistic nuclear missiles in Cuba, sparking a crisis as the United States demands their removal via a blockade. On October 31st, This Is All Made Up reports an outbreak in the Pentagon and suggests total evacuation of Washington, D.C. Yes, that is right. His name, although not spelt the same, is pronounced This Is All Made Up. This could mean This Is All Made Up literally. I don't really know. Anyways, on November 11th, Gersh begins work on the Thunder Gun, codenamed Project Thunder. On December 12th, Gersh and Yuri begin work on the Gersh device based on revelations of the nature of the ether thanks to the Apothecan Blood, codenames Project Mercury. The following
following year, February 23rd, 1963, Cornelius Purnell reports that Dr. Schuster has claimed Samantha is responsible for numerous outbreaks of the undead over the past 20 years, including the Rising Sun facility. Purnell decides to investigate further. On June 6th, Ryan Jackson writes up a profile on Major General Nikita Dragovich, noting his contempt for Victor Reznov. On June 15th, the Pentagon begins development on their own versions of the Wunderwaffe DG2. On June 21st, Colonel Sawyer reports the need to establish a teleporter to Griffin Station before the Soviets and grows suspicious that Schuster is intentionally delaying progress on the project out of fear. He is also suspicious that Pennell believes Schuster's stories about Samantha. On June 26th, Evelyn Cross informs John F. Kennedy he won't ask you again and I know this was his final order. She asks that he reconsiders or puts his life at risk. Our people are everywhere. This time you cannot win. Give him what he wants before it's too late. On the same day, Kennedy gives his famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech. On July 18th, the proposed final design for TEDD or TED, a robotic bus driver at the Hanford facility is drawn up. Notable issues include the presence of emotions, inappropriate behaviour towards employees and an unnerving appearance. On July 23rd, the Ascension Group draws up schematics for the Tundra Gun, a variant of the Thunder Gun. On July 23rd, Cornelius Pennell plans to report his findings about the growing threat of Samantha and the need for a joint operation at Groom Lake known as Broken Arrow. On August 3rd, in the same year, 1963, we see our ninth Ultimus encounter. During teleportation testing at Groom Lake, Ultimus arrives from Moon in 2025. Samantha, having been plucked from Richtofen's body, they are held captive and used as test subjects. In the same year, August 17th, the Pentagon begins development of their own version of the Winter's Howl under Project Scaddy. On September 3rd, Cornelius Purnell reports a successful meeting with Secretary McNamara and his agreement to create the Broken Arrow program. On October 6th, the Vokuta mission occurs. Alex Mason escapes Vokuta, becoming separated from Reznov. On October 8th, Jason Hudson confirms with John F. Kennedy that the November 10th briefing of Alex Mason is all set up. On October 10th, D. King informs Jason Hudson of his next assassination to act as a handler for Alex Mason. The next day, October 11th, Dr. Adrian Smith forwards Alex Mason's psychological assessment to Jason Hudson, informing him that despite her recommendations, Mason has been cleared for field duty. On the same day, Ryan Jackson sends Jason Hudson everything he needs to know about Dracovich, Kravchenko, Steiner and GK. A couple days later, October 13th, Ultimus's 10th and final rendezvous takes place within the normal cycle, where they shall remain until the Earth is destroyed by Maxis. In the broken cycle, this takes place prior to the classified ending cutscene. A zombie dressed in World War II German uniform containing the soul of Edward Richthofen arrives at Groom Lake. Richthofen re-enters his own comatose body. On October 18th, under the orders of Samantha, Dr. Lehman unleashes gaseous element 115 in the air filtration system of the Pentagon, creating an outbreak of the undead before shooting himself. On the same day, John McCone thanks Dr. Adrian Smith for her analysis of Alex Mason, asking that she destroys any copies of the report. On October 21st, National Security Advisor Muck George Bundy asks John McCone to speed up Alex Mason's approval as an operational field agent, as he was handpicked by the President for an operation to eliminate Nikita Dragovich. On the same day, October 21st, despite his misgivings, about Alex Mason, Richard Kane is asked by John McCone to sign off on Mason's field operational status. The following day, October 22nd, blueprints are drawn up for a 115 drill to be built near Groom Lake, and it is predicted to be completed by 1964. The following day, October 23rd, Ryan Jackson informs Richard Kane that he was unable to acquire Alex Mason's psyche evaluation. He maintains his position that Alex Mason is a danger to national security. The same day, Richard Kane replies to Ryan Jackson's message about Alex Mason, denying his request to reassess Alex Mason's field status. He says Mason will provide the best opportunity for the CIA to eliminate Nikita Dragovich. On October 28th, Kino the Totem takes place, which is Ultimus's third embarkment. From Deris, Ultimus teleports to Kino. This marks the first time Ultimus travels across time and space. Temporal rifts occur across dimensions. In light of these developments, Ultimus locates a lunar lander and flies to the Ascension facility. The following day, Day, October 29th, Gersh informs the senior staff that Yuri has been removed from Project Mercury and has been transferred.
transferred to Rocket Research. The same day, Yuri begins to notice the appearance of children's toys around the facility. Later that day, LL Lemnitsa provides a preliminary review of Broken Arrow's purpose as a joint operation between the CIA and DOD for all 115 experiments. He outlines the plan to hold a diplomatic meeting between President Kenny and Fidel Castro to create an assembly of allied nations to combat Samantha should she become a threat. On October 31st, General Earl Wheeler creates a memorandum for the staff of the Pentagon in response to the recent outbreak caused by Dr. Lehman, who reportedly began hearing the voice of Samantha after reading Richthofen's journal. He informs the staff that the Pentagon must be properly maintained before President Kennedy's meeting with Fidel Castro. On November 1st, upon reading Richthofen's journal, Yuri begins to hear Samantha's voice. Over several days, her voice will consume him, driving him to the brink of insanity. She orders him to resume work on the Gersh device. He obeys. On the same day, Ryan Jackson writes up a profile on Dmitry Petrenko. Similarly, on the same day, Ryan Jackson sends a memo to Richard Kane suggesting that Alex Mason not be given field operational status due to the likelihood that he may have been compromised in Volkuta. The following day, November 2nd, the Hanford Project in Washington is formally integrated into Broken Arrow. Secretary McNamara denies their request in the MPD reconstruction project, believing it should remain at Groom Lake. On November 4th, Gersh announces to the committee that Project Thunder is nearing completion. Gersh reveals Yuri may need to be removed from Ascension entirely, having observed him being hostile towards other scientists and frequently he observed him muttering to himself. On November 5th, Classified takes place, which is Ultimus's seventh encounter. Ultimus arrives in the Pentagon, fighting off the undead outbreak, before eventually arriving at Groom Lake. On November 5th, obeying Samantha's wishes, Yuri tricks Gersh into activating the Gersh device. The rift created absorbs him and allows Samantha to travel through. Yuri is also absorbed and transported to the Pentagon. The following day, November 6th, Ascension takes place, which is Ultimus's fourth encounter. Ultimus arrives at the Soviet Cosmodrome and frees Gersh from the Casimir mechanism. Casimir mechanism safety protocol initiated. Shutting down power systems. Ah, yes! I'm free! I cannot thank you enough for releasing me from that, that horrible place. Richtofen recovers his diary and learns that they need the Vril device from the Siberian facility for his plan. Maintaining his ethereal form, Gersh sends them into a rift to their next destination before beginning his travels across space and time. Shortly after the outbreak, Harvina confirms all personnel present at the Cosmodrome are dead, with Dr. Zivoisky and Dr. Gersh being missing. He rallies disgruntled scientists together and proposes delivering the Apothecan blood to Pablo Marinus. The following day, November 6th, five takes place. Place. In the Pentagon, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon and Robert McNamara meet with Fidel Castro in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis to discuss a partnership between the two countries in facing the Samantha threat. Due to the events at the Cosmodrome, a zombie outbreak occurs. Samantha sends Yuri to the Pentagon to thwart their survival. After Gersh is freed and Ultimus departs from the Cosmodrome, the outbreak ends at the Pentagon. All four survive. On November 8th, Colonel Sawyer orders Cornelius Pennell to halt all ongoing attempts to combat Samantha following the third outbreak at the Pentagon and the capture of Yuri. He confirms that with Dr. Gersh missing from the Ascension group, infighting had begun and the group may fall apart soon. On the same day, with the loss of Dr. Gersh, Yuna puts together a small team to deliver the Apothecan blood to Pablo Marinas in Siberia in order to craft the Agathan device. On November 10th, the mission USDD occurs. Alex Mason and Jason Hudson arrive with Secretary McNamara to to meet with John F. Kennedy at the Pentagon to discuss eliminating Nikita Dragovich. On the same day, Jason Hudson chastises Alex Mason for his CIA data server password, which is, quite funnily, just password. On November 17th, we see during the Executive Order mission, Black Ops agents infiltrate the Bayakanoa Cosmodrome to eliminate Nikita Dragovich, rescue Grigori Weaver, and halt the Ascension Group's research. On the same day, Gunnery Sergeant Jake Reed offers to get beers with Alex Mason as both are former Marines. On November 19th, a mysterious John Trent warns Jason Hudson that everything changes on Friday. John Trent claims to know Alex Mason. On the same day, in an effort to avoid another undead outbreak, the US government creates the Broken Arrow program, establishing several facilities across the country. The Groom Lake program is folded into Broken Arrow. On November 21st, John Trent informs Jason Hudson it was by the hand of Nikita Dragovich. He 
claims they are everywhere and this is just the beginning. He tells Hudson to start at Volkuta and that the other Volkuta escapee has just died. On the same day, November 21st, John Trent informs John F. Kennedy, you have one day left. Victory cannot be achieved without sacrifice. On November 22nd, John F. Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Alex Mason was reported as missing for the period surrounding the assassination, which leads to the fact that it seems to allude that Alex Mason was actually the John F. Kennedy killer. On November 23rd, Lyndon B. Johnson informs members of the CIA data server of his intent to do everything in his power to uphold the late Kennedy's ideals. The following day, November 24th, Gregory Weaver thanks Alex Mason for his and Frank Wood's actions at Baconer. On November 25th, John Trent sends Jason Hudson a mysterious photo of someone named Elvine Cross. On December 24th, CIA Director John A. McCone approves of Project MK Alpha, an extension of MK Ultra. Broken Arrow is set to build an artificial MPD known as the APD at Camp Edward. Broken Arrow will use the APD as a method of interrogation. Sometime between the same day, December 24th, 1963, and January 25th, 1965, the APD is constructed. However, Broken Arrow struggles to find a power source without access to human life force. Shortly after, Dr. Hale discovers that Adams, or ADAMS, powered by the elemental shard, can be used as sources. The following year, January 1st, 1964, the Apothecum Blood escapes containment at the Siberian facility, crashing the Russian ship and killing Harvey Yena, just days before he was due to finally return to the US. Later that month, on January 24th, Ryan Jackson writes a memo analyzing the capabilities of the Viet Cong. Sometime before May 11th, 1964, Dr. Hale discovers that the elemental shard is capable of outputting an incredible amount of energy compared to the average 115. Believing it to be Dr. Maxis's Genesis code, she notes that Adam's charge with the shard exhibit traits that suggest they are sentient. On May 11th, Paxton Gunner Ridge recovers the bones of Peter McCain, still at the Rising Sun facility, and has it sent to Camp Edward. On June 1st, under the supervision of Director Pennell, Dr. Hale is able to revive Peter McCain using the element shard. This marks the true completion of Maxis's Genesis Code. Sometime between June 1st, 1964 and February 8th, 1965, Peter McCain continues to recover from his revival and agrees to work for Broken Arrow. Pennell reveals that the DoD forced Broken Arrow to relinquish the Elemental Shard, however he kept a portion for himself. Peter swears his loyalty to the company over the country. On January 25th, 1965, Brigadier General Sawyer submits Yuri as the first candidate for Phase 2 of Project MK Alpha, in order to discover his motivations for infiltrating the Pentagon and his relation to Samantha. On February 8th, Peter McCain details the transfer and interrogation that is to take place on the MK Alpha subject, Yuri. On February 14th, Yuri is interrogated by Director Purnell for the first time. Sometime later, he dies during interrogation. On February 17th, John McCone forwards a report to President Johnson regarding suspicious nuclear activity in Israel. On April 10th, Broken Arrow draws up schematics for Sergeant Adam, a variation of the Adam robot designed for combat. On May 13th, Ryan Jackson writes a memo suggesting increased SOG or SOG involvement in Laos. On July 11th, Rushmore becomes operational at Camp Edward, possibly bearing the visage of J. Robert Oppenheimer as an homage from the scientists to their wrongfully dismissed colleague. On August 17th, the Department of Defense requests explosives exploration of Project Toy Soldier to repurpose home service personal robots called Adams as soldiers. On September 1st, Ryan Jackson creates a memo proposing additional CIA presence at a combat base in South Vietnam. On September 16th, Alex Mason urges Jason Hudson to inform his superiors that Nikita Dragovich needs to be killed and that no matter what, Mason will do something about it, himself if necessary. On September 17th, Jason Hudson informs Alex Mason that his fixation on Dragovich is obsessive and that he should slow it down and quit mumbling to himself. On October 13th, satellite images show a military settlement on Rebirth Island. On September 5th, schematics for the mobile matter transference device are drawn up by Broken Arrow. On November 8th, blueprints for the Raygun Mark 2V, 2X, 2Y and 2Z are drawn up. The following year, February 2nd, 1966, Alex Mason's father sends Alex a letter informing him that his mother has fallen ill and telling him to return home immediately. Later that month, on February 14th, Grigori Weaver
Weaver set up a date between Alex Mason and Sarah Leary. On February 18th, Sarah Leary chastises Gregory Weaver for setting her and Alex Mason up on a date, suggesting Mason needs professional help after his ramblings about Reznov and Dragovich. Later that day, Alex Mason chastises Gregory Weaver for setting him and Sarah Leary on a date, sarcastically claiming it went great. On March 15th, Ryan Jackson writes a memo suggesting SOG or SOG operations to liberate NVA prison camps. Later that day, on March 15th, after 10 letters without a response, Alex Mason's mother finally passes away. His father gives him five days to return home and attend her funeral service, and if he does not, to never come back. Later that month, on March 20th, Alex Mason's father informs Alex he has failed. He tells him that he should have died in Volcuta. On March 22nd, Alex Mason's sister, Marion, chastises Alex for missing their mother's funeral. She tells him if he needs a place to go, her door is always open. On May 13th, Ryan Jackson creates a memo proposing the use of an MRF patrol boat by CIA agents in Laos. On June 5th, Richard Kane asks Ryan Jackson to find all that he can about Victor Reznov. He is suspicious of how two men could escape Volcuta without internal support and suggests Alex Mason may be compromised. On June 6th, Ryan Jackson provides a biography of Victor Reznov named The Wolf to Richard Kane. On August 1st, Daniel Clark realizes that Dragovich is killing freelance scientists participating in Project Nova after their work is done. He plans to flee to Johannesburg with his brother. Now my friend and fellow YouTuber DK Dynamite is going to continue with the rest of the timeline for the remainder of this video. Now on September 8th, 1966, Cornelius Purnell documents two dreams he had the night prior. In the first, two robed angels with carnivorous teeth take Purnell's mother away and he has no way of stopping them. In the second, during an interrogation within the APD, electricity from the elemental shard is shot into Purnell's spine. The voices in Purnell's head informed him this was the path he must take if he is to ascend to Agartha. Purnell attempted to follow the schematics for the Agartha device found within scans received from Yenna detailing Richtofen's journal. However, Purnell believed the components did not exist and his project was then abandoned. Now, a couple months later, on December the 19th, Ryan Jackson writes a profile on Lev Kravchenko. Now, on January 2nd, 1967, Woods tells Mason that they should stop wasting time with this techno garbage and focus on fighting the communists. Now, a couple days later, on January 8th, Ryan Jackson requests data regarding the Soviet military industrial complex. Two days later, Hudson informs Mason that Woods is voluntarily left for Vietnam to lead SOG incursions in Laos. Now, on February 11, 1967, Richard Kane asked that Gregory Weaver cease using the CIA data server to communicate with him. Now, on February 22nd, Hudson tells Weaver that whatever Mason did is not his fault and it is their duty to bring him back and use his knowledge to take down Dragovich. Now, on April 14th, 1967, Ryan Jackson writes up a profile on both Daniel Clark and Frederick Steiner. Now, on August 3rd, 1967, Purnell convinces Dr. Hale to assist him in testing the APD with himself and the elemental shard, flooding the interior with the shard's electricity. Now, about a month later, on September the 11th, Weaver informs Hudson that Harris has confirmed that the Pentagon has been compromised. He has intercepted transmission fragments being sent from inside the Pentagon. Now, on the 25th of September, Weaver shares with Hudson another broadcast being sent to the Pentagon, calling it the Trigger. On the same day, Weaver sends an encrypted message to Hudson, informing him that John F. Kennedy met with Evelyn Cross on the same day as his Berlin speech. Now, a month later, on October the 20th, Ryan Jackson writes a memo to Richard Helms, suggesting a sabotage of Soviet operations at Rebirth Island. The island is suspected to be the test site for Soviet bioweapons, the research having been acquired from Japan's Unit 731 after World War II. Now, about a week later, on October 27th, Weaver sends Hudson another intercepted transmission. Now, fast forward to January 3rd, 1968, Richard Kane sends a file to Hudson regarding hypnotic techniques. Now, on January 18th, D. King informs Jason Hudson that he and Alex Mason are being sent to K. San, where they will meet with Frank Woods. He warns Hudson to keep Mason on a short leash. 
Three days later, Hudson, Mason, and Woods defend against an NVA siege in Kaesan. Now on January 23rd, Ryan Jackson compiles an analysis of the NVA. Three days later, Dr. Weiss witnesses Director Purnell and Dr. Hale's unauthorized access of the APD. A couple days later, Ryan Jackson writes a memo confirming Nikita Dragovich is still living and spearheading the newly discovered Project Nova along with Lev Kavchenko. Now on February 2nd, Deputy Director Peter McCain witnesses another of Director Purnell and Dr. Hale's unauthorized experiments. Now on the same day, we have the defector. Mason, Woods, and Bowman arrive in Hugh City to meet with a Russian defector. The defector dies, but Mason believes he is living as Viktor Reznov. Now on February 3rd, just a day later, National Security Advisor Walt Rostow informs President Johnson of his support in any action taken in South Vietnam. The next day, Peter McCain logs into incidents with Purnell and Hale, noting Purnell's increasingly erratic behavior as well as the doctor's affection for Purnell. Purnell decides to inform the Department of Defense. Now sometime between February 4th and March 15th, Cornelius Purnell locks Peter McCain in solitary confinement and Peter's soul is placed into the body of an atom unit. Now on February 4th, 1968, Gregory Weaver informs Brooks and Harris of their upcoming mission to Mount Yemental. Now on the same day, Kamchenko records the success of Dr. Daniel Clark's stabilizing agents being used in Nova 6. He suggests that this is the most effective strain thus far. Now the next day, Dr. Smith asks Brooks to watch her cat while she is away, implying a continued romantic interest in him. Brooke declines due to the upcoming mission and suggests the two talk when he returns about their relationship. He suspects his wife is aware of their affair. Now two days later, Ryan Jackson sends an excerpt from Daniel Clark's journal to Richard Kane. Now on February 9th, Victor Charlie, Mason's team raids a Viet Cong outpost and discovers intel in one of Kravchenko's underground labs. The same day, we have numbers. Jason Hudson and Gregory Weaver interrogate Daniel Clark for information about Nova 6. Now the next day, on February 10th, Richard Kane asks Ryan Johnson to find information about MK Ultra and its sub-projects. He also asks that he send anything related to MK Search to Jason Hudson in order to get to the bottom of Alex Mason's issues. On the same day, Hudson sends an encrypted message to President Johnson informing him of Clark's death, a confirmation on a Nova 6 threat to the United States, an update to the Dreamland server, and his intent to go to Mount Yemental. Now on February 10th as well, Brooks asked Jason Hudson to give him a general time frame of their next operation so he can inform his wife. Now on February 11th, we have Crash Site. A Russian plane carrying Nova 6 goes down over Laos and Mason's team is sent to investigate. They are captured by Specknaz. Now on the same day, Weaver informs Richard Kane that he has new information about Alex Mason, their two-faced friend. He believes he cannot be trusted. Hudson then informs Brooks, Weaver, and Harris that they will be leaving for Mount Mount Yemendao on February 16th. Now, a couple days later, on February 15th, 1968, Ryan Jackson sends a transcript of Kravchenko's recording to Richard Kane. Ryan Jackson also writes a memo to Richard Kane suggesting that Kravchenko is testing Nova 6 on the local population, leaving dead American operatives to give the impression that deaths were caused by the United States. Now, a day later, as Hudson, Weaver, Brooks, and Harris leave for Mount Yemendao, Harris's wife leaves a message for Harris telling him to stay safe on his mission to Paris. Now, two days later, Hudson and Weaver infiltrate Mount Yemendao, the last known location of Dr. Steiner. On February 19th, payback, Mason and Woods escape Viet Cong imprisonment, stealing a hind and freeing POWs. Woods and Kravchenko brawl and become separated from Mason. A day later, Ryan Jackson writes a memo to Richard Kane sharing his analysis of GKM, the shell company being used to funnel Nova 6 into Vietnam. The company is registered to Kravchenko's cousin, Pavel Gorky, who was notably involved in the Doris massacre and ensuing standoff with United States forces. After raids on the offices of associates companies located in the U.S., it was found that these companies had no actual living employees. On the same day, February 20th, Ryan Jackson sends Hudson important information on MK Search to aid in interrogating Alex Mason. Now, just two days later, on February 22nd, Ryan Jackson warns Hudson that Mason cannot be trusted and suggests that
that once all needed info is acquired from interrogation, Mason should be killed. About a day later, we have Rebirth. Mason enacts Reznov's revenge, killing Dr. Steiner before Hudson and Weaver can stop him. About two days later, we have Revelations. After interrogation, Mason has a revelation that he was brainwashed at Vorkuta to be a sleeper agent. He realizes the numbers broadcast station is on a ship called the Rusalka. About a day later, Hudson sends an encrypted message to President Johnson, telling him Mason is delusional, mumbling about numbers. He suggests initiating a fallback operation. On the same day, we have Redemption. Mason, Hudson, and Weaver attack the Rosalka, destroying the number station and killing Dragovich. About a day later, John Trent returns, telling Hudson, you have done well. He says to tell Mason one more thing. This time, it's freedom for both of us. Two days later, on February 29th, Robert McNamara resigns as a Secretary of Defense. On March 15th, in Elemental Shar Test number 54, Sawyer arrives and orders an end to the test. Purnell becomes the Avogadro, leaking Nova 6 throughout Camp Edward, and he is eventually captured and held inside of the APD. Now, on July 1st, 1968, Gregory Weaver informs Jason Hudson of Alex Mason's apparent migraines. He has suggested Mason retire, and in turn, Mason claims he has unfinished business. About a month later, on August 12th, Ryan Jackson's wife makes cupcakes for his workplace. Now, a couple months later, on October 28, 1968, White House Press Secretary George Christian informs President Johnson that his address to the nation on the bombing of North Vietnam is all set. A couple days later, on November the 2nd, Ryan Jackson writes a memo confirming mass civilian killings by the NVA in Hugh City. On November the 5th, Lyndon B. Johnson congratulates Richard Nixon on his victory in running for president. On the same day, Nixon thanks Lyndon Johnson for his message. Now, about a month later, on December 23rd, 1968, Dr. Smith suggests to Alex Mason to meet and discuss upping his dosage to counter his reoccurring migraines. She says he should see his family in Alaska. Mason says he no longer has has any family in Alaska and asks for an up the dosage, otherwise he may kill himself. She then asks him to come in and discuss the dosage. Now, on January 20th, 1969, Nixon is inaugurated as President of the United States. Now, on June 10th, a couple months later, Ryan Jackson writes a memo to Richard Kane with a loose timeline of the construction of the Soviet number station in Cuba that was recently destroyed. He believes the Cuban Missile Crisis was a diversion by Dragovich to divert attention away from the base being built. Now on July 20th, the first manned mission to the surface of the moon does take place. Now on March 2nd, 1970, Ryan Jackson writes a memo to Richard Kane suggesting that the Soviets allowed Mason to escape for Kuta in order to act as a sleeper agent. He believes this imprinting failed due to Viktor Reznov's intervention. Now on January 30th, 1973, three whole years later, the Office of Scientific Intelligence Administrator provides Richard Kane with the breakdown of MK Ultra's goals and results. On February 1st, CIA Director Richard Helms informs Richard Kane to cease his unsanctioned operations. He also asks that all data he has collected on MK Ultra be returned to the OSI or destroyed. Now, on December 19, 1974, Ryan Jackson asks to speak with Dr. Smith about a personal problem. Now, on November 19, 1977, three whole years later, X leaves a note for Gregory Weaver and informing him that his sister, Olga, survived Stalin's purge and died in childbirth on November 19th, 1955. She had a daughter named Christina. A couple days later, Gregory Weaver asked Ryan Jackson to locate a long-lost niece named Christina who may be his last surviving relative. On the same day, Richard Kane tells Ryan Jackson not to pursue Weaver's request to locate his niece and to tell him anything. Now, a couple days later, November 27th, Ryan Jackson informs Weaver that he cannot access information on his niece. Now, on April 13, 1978, a biography is written up on Christina Raskova, a GRU agent who agreed to work with the CIA as a double agent and is the niece of Gregory Weaver. Her current GRU assignment is to seduce and detain Alex Mason, making her an ideal candidate for Operation Carabas. Now, on May 12, 1978, Richard Kane congratulates Ryan Jackson on his promotion as Kane's assistant. Now, in June, on the 19th, a mysterious ex leaves a note for Jason Hudson telling him not to trust D. King, saying he works for Richard Kane, who has his eye on Hudson. Now, on June 30th, about a week later, X leaves a note for Alex Mason now, telling him that Daniel Clark had a brother in Johannesburg who he intended to hide with. They say this is a good place to start. Now, on July 4th, 1978, 
X leaves a note for Alex Mason again, telling him that Frank Woods is alive and didn't die with Kravchenko back during the events of Black Ops 1. Now on the same day, Hudson warns Mason to stay away from Johannesburg, claiming that Richard Kane is watching them. Now on September the 5th, 1978, Richard Kane asks Ryan Jackson to start the file OPC, compiling all information on Nova 6 that he can find. About a month later, October the 3rd, Richard Kane sends Ryan Jackson a breakdown of Operation Carabis, a top secret operation to track down and eliminate Jason Hudson, Gregory Weaver, and Alex Mason, considering them a danger to national security. Now, October 27th, 1978, Ryan Jackson writes a memo to Richard Kane requesting temporary field operation status to deal with Mason personally in Operation Carabis. Carabis will be a joint operation with the M16 and the SAS. The SAS sending Johnson Price Sir as the lead. Now, three days later, Richard Kane informs Jackson that his request for field operational status has been approved, gifting him the art of war for his efforts in gathering information about Alex Mason. Now, September 29th, 1979, Rossman begins work at Broken Arrow. Over the course of his employment, his extensive exposure to 115 leads to significant memory loss. Now, on April 20th, 1983, four whole years later, Broken Arrow begins live animal experiments with a half of the shard kept by the DOD, Department of Defense, creating the bios. Now, three years later, on June 24th, 1986, a containment breach involving the bios occurs at one of the Broken Arrow facilities, and Russman is one of the few to escape alive. The facility is shut down and abandoned. Its projects are transferred to other locations. Now, on July 2nd, 1986, we have Pyrrhic Victory. After assisting Jonas Savimbi against the MPLA, Hudson and Mason rescue Woods from imprisonment, injuring Menendez as they make their escape. Now, September the 5th, 1986, Old Wounds, Woods and Mason assist against the invading Soviets along Tian Zhao. They are betrayed and left in the desert. 20 days later, we have Time and Fate, Mason, Hudson, and Woods work with Manuel Noriega to track down Raul Menendez. In a fit of rage, Wood tosses a grenade, accidentally killing Raul's sister, Josefina. Now, on December the 20th, 1989, suffer with me, Mason and Woods capture Noriega in Panama. Woods is ordered to execute a target he believes to be Menendez by Hudson, only to find the target was Mason. Menendez reveals his attentions to Woods before executing Hudson and telling Mason son, David, to come find him for revenge. Now, on December 26, 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. Five years later, June 24th, 1996, Victus arrives at the abandoned Broken Arrow facility. Still being pursued by Undead Richtofen, they recover the Element 115 shard and depart through another rift. Now, on April 18, 2000, the United Nations adopts Resolution 1295, placing sanctions on the National Union for the total independence of Angola due to their ongoing civil war. Eleven years later, on March 17, 2011, we have Call of the Dead. After entering the rift, Ultimus arrives at the Siberian facility in 2011, where they find themselves trapped in a closet while George Romero films his latest project at that location. Samantha, in her pursuit of Ultimus, unleashes an un dead outbreak. The film stars fight the undead, Horde, ultimately recovering the Vril device for Richtofen. Ultimus teleports to Shangri-La in an effort to acquire the next artifact required to defeat Samantha, the Focusing Stone. Now on April 11, 2011, following the disappearance of the Call of the Dead cast and crew, Romero's assistant Sally begins the search for her boss. Her journey leads her to Shangri-La during an eclipse, which sends her back in time to April 25th, 1956. Now in December 2019, in Wuhan, China, the COVID COVID-19 virus is first identified leading to a global pandemic. Now, on April 10th, 2023, Broken Arrow creates the denizens of the forest. Now, on April 19th, 2025, Raul Menendez visits Frank Woods in the vault, warning him, now it begins, JSOC agents arrive later when Woods tells Mason's son, David, of Menendez's rise to power. Now, a day later, we have Solarium. JSOC agents, including David, investigate Menendez's links to a new microchip made from Solarium in Myanmar. Now, on May 21st, 2025, we have FOB Spectre. JSOC attempts to defend forward operating base Spectre in India from invading SDC forces. Now, on May 29th, 2025, Fallen Angel, David Mason and other JSOC agents gather intel on Raul Menendez at his stronghold in Pakistan. Now, on June 12th, 2025, we have Karma. JSOC agents infiltrate a high-end getaway called 
Colossus in search of a cyber weapon called Karma. They discover Karma is a person and succeed in killing Menendez's general, Falco, before she can be taken prisoner. Now on June 19th, we have Achilles Veal. JLCC agents capture all Menendez in Yemen. Now on June 19th as well, we have Odysseus. After interrogation on the USS Barack Obama, mercenaries allow Rawl to escape. On the same day, we have Cordes Dai. Menendez is following, known as Cordes Dai, stages an attack on Los Angeles using hacked U.S. technology. JSOC agents escort U.S. President Bosworth to safety, fighting back against the attack. Now, also on the same day, we have Judgment Day. JSOC and their allies across the world invade Menendez's base in Haiti, where David Mason makes the final choice that will decide Menendez's fate. On July 6, 2025, Project Manager Russman and Case Officer Barkley arrive at Camp Edward to transfer a sample of Cornelius Purnell, dormant within the APD, to the Hanford site for testing. On July 8th, two days later, Broken Arrow accidentally creates the Avogadro using the sample collected from Camp Edward. Now, September the 1st, 2025, in desperate need of more 115, Broken Arrow uses an excavator to drill near the nuclear testing facility known as Nuketown. Now, a month later, October the 13th, we have Moon. Using the Vril device and the Focusing Stone, Richtofen completes his grand scheme and swaps bodies with Samantha on the Moon, giving him full control of the zombies and the ether. Maxis contacts the remaining members of Ultimus through the station's electronics and asks for their help to defeat Richtofen. They agree. They launch missiles at Earth, leaving it fractured and broken. They sever Richtofen's connection with the ether, but he maintains control over the zombies. Once Maxis controls the ether in 2035, he returns to the Moon and plucks Samantha from Richtofen's body to join him in Agartha. Now, on the same day, we have Nuketown zombies. A nuclear bomb explodes outside of Nuketown. As a result of Broken Arrow's drilling, CIA and CDC operatives arrive to find an undead outbreak already in progress. One of the missiles from the moon hits Nuketown, killing all on site except for Marlton Johnson, who survives by hiding in a nuclear bunker. Now, also on the same day, October 13th, the Earth fracturing triggers further temporal rifts and Arthur is pulled from 1318 through a rift all the way to 2021 arriving in the Barry Purgatory Point, now accessible from the surface as a result of the missile impact. Now, about a month later, November the 5th, Broken Arrow is disbanded after the primary facility is lost in a fire. It is later believed to be an act of arson committed by employees, destroying evidence, implicating them in the outbreak. Russman, his mind broken after over 40 years of exposure to 115, begins to wander the Earth. Now, on March 18, 2027, two years later, in a distress call, former CDC Assistant Director George Barkley reveals that the infectionist contaminants have gone airborne. He advises caution regarding any allies showing signs of short-term memory loss, psychosis, delusion, and paranoia. Now, on March 27th, a society of survivors who can eat the undead is formed. They are called the Flesh. Now, on May 12, 2027, Samuel Stuhlinger joins the Flesh. On June 28th, about a month later, through the consumption of the undead meat, the flesh begin hearing Richtofen's voice. He tries to persuade them to build global polarization devices for him in pursuit of his new plan to mend the rift in space-time and acquire full control over the ether. On the same day, Maxis begins communicating to survivors on Earth, telling those willing to listen to build global polarization devices for him in pursuit of his new plan to open a Garth and reunite him with Samantha, even though it will result in the destruction of the Earth, unknowingly for Victus. Now, on April 4th, 2028, about a year later, the flesh broadcast their message across all frequencies. They tell others to heed our call and the path to enlightenment can be achieved by consuming the undead. On December 9th, 2028, Maxis's followers begin congregating around the polarization device at the Hanford site facility. Now, on January 3rd, 2029, Maxis's followers begin to doubt him, believing he may in fact be evil. They destroy their electronics. Now, on March 2nd, 2029, Maxis's followers attempt to speak to him again. Many have begun to hear Richtofen, and those loyal to Maxis eagerly await further instructions. Now, on August 15th, quite a few months later, a broadcast is sent out confirming the fall of the flesh 
and Maxis's followers, with each group hearing the voice of Richtofen or Maxis, a battle broke out between them. As they fought, a zombie horde moved in and destroyed all who remained. Sulinger is one of the few to escape. Richtofen and Maxis are left with no one to communicate near Green Run, where the first polarization device must be constructed. Now, six years later, on October 13th, 2035, Stuhlinger bumps into Russman, who has stolen a bus from an abandoned Broken Arrow facility. On October 21st, 2035, we have Transit. Stuhlinger and Russman run into Marlton and Misty at a diner near the Hanford site facility. Max has asked them to complete the polarization device in his favor. Stuhlinger, having consumed zombie meat, is contacted by Richtofen, who orders Stuhlinger to construct the device for him instead. The crew constructs the device for Maxis ultimately, and the four will later become known as Victus. On October 22nd, 2035, we have Diarize. Still hoping to regain control, Rictus teleports Victus to Province 22, where he demands that Stuhlinger activate the second polarization device. Once again, the crew sides with Maxis. The voices cease for some time, leaving Victus to wander the Earth. Many months later, on December 31st, 2035, we have Buried. Victus arrive at Purgatory Point, now located beneath a mining facility in Angola. They discover Arthur in a jail cell. He assists them on their journey, and the voices of Maxis and Richtofen return. They activate the final polarization device in Maxis's favor. Now corrupted by the Dark Aether, he reveals his true intentions to Victus and punishes Richtofen by trapping his soul in a zombie. Drawn into Agartha by her father, Samantha Samantha witnesses the evil that has corrupted him, and when a rift opens up in Dimension 63 in 1918, she reaches out to that timeline's Maxis for help. Now on January 10th, 2036, Richtofen instructs undead Richtofen to pursue Victus and recover their blood vials. Also, about nine days later, Primus Richtofen begins to manipulate Stuhlinger, opening a rift for Victus to begin their new journey. Pursued by undead Richtofen and an army of the undead, Victus enters the rift. On the same day, Maxis destroys the Earth and all of its surviving inhabitants. Now when it comes to fractures, when one travels back in a dimension and changes something, not only do you create a new future, in that dimension, but in order to avoid a paradox, the past changes in order to make your alteration possible. The Deceptio, Prodidion, and Angonia fractures are all fundamentally based on the original dimension. However, each fracture takes the course of history further and further away. So with the first example, we have the Deceptio fracture. On October 13, 1945, we have the Giant. As a zombie outbreak occurs, Primus, Dempsey, Takio, and Nikolai confront Ultimus Richtofen moments after he teleports Maxis and Samantha. As they try to reason with him to wake their counterparts, Primus Richtofen arrives through the teleporter and kills his Ultimus self, triggering fractures across time and space. As Primus fights the undead, Group 935 secure the Dempsey subject and transport him to their Eisendrak. One of the changes that occurs in the history of this fracture is that 935 were granted enough funding from the Reichstag tag in order to complete the giant project. As a result, Primus are able to pursue the Dempsey test subject in one of these giants. Now, October 29th, 1945, Dr. Groff takes control of Group 935 in Richtofen's absence, not realizing his fate at the hands of Primus back at the giant. October 31st, 1945, in the wake of haunted dreams and rumors that Samantha may be roaming Griffin Station, Groff worries the MPD may be corrupting the facility. Now, on November 5th, 1945, we have Dreisendrak recovering the Dempsey subject from the rocket bound for the moon. Richtofen secures his soul and reveals the Primus's intention to set things right. Primus destroyed Griffin Station and the moon. Now when it comes to the Prodidion fracture, we have April 12th, 1942. Overrun by the undead, the Rising Sun facility is lost. On July 8, 1942, Division 9 begins construction of the island facility known as Zetsubo no Shima. Now, on October the 9th, with construction complete, Division 9 continue their projects at the island facility, and about a month later, November the 5th, Takio is dispatched by the Emperor to oversee the work of Division 9 at this island facility. Now, just a few months later, on February 6, 1943, Division 9 expands experimentation to include the use of prisoners of war, Division 9 staff, 
half arachnids and the possibility of reanimating ancient dragons from fossil eggs. These being recovered, of course, within this fracture as a result of yet more changes being done to the past. However, these mythical beasts were never successfully reanimated and Division 9 deemed the project a failure. Now, on June 15, 1943, Takeo reports to the Emperor the work being done at the island facility is unacceptable. Now, a few days later, on June 24th, on the order of the Emperor, Takeo is taken prisoner by Division 9 and he is used as a test subject for their organic plant-based experiments. Now, September the 13th, 1945, Cornelia attempts to send the transmission to Peter McCain, telling him to rendezvous at the abandoned Rising Sun facility. Now, on October 18th, 1945, Zetsubo Noshima, Primus secures to Kale's soul after they help him commit seppuku. Richtofen takes the crew to the Alcatraz pocket dimension, where the mobsters are still stuck within their loop to collect their blood for the insurance policy. They return to the island before traveling to their next destination. Now on the same day, Peter McCain makes his jump into Shinonuma as a temporal rift opens below him. As a result of Primus's universe fracture, the rift teleports him to Garad Krovi instead. Now at the Agonia fracture, we have November 11th, 1942. Graf confirms that Division 9 has completed the resurrection of the ancient beast for the battle on the Eastern Front. Within this fracture, the past has been changed enough that Division 9 were able to resurrect these dragons. Reports suggest that the specimens are still extremely dangerous, but the German stalemate on the Eastern Front with the Russians will soon come to an end thanks to their involvement. Now on January 3rd, 1943, the Russians used stolen Group 935 research to create the Russian Gigant, the Russian Mangler, and the Raygun Mark III. Now on February 2nd, 1943, the Battle of Stalingrad doesn't end. Thanks to the technological advantage advancements on both sides, World War II continues indefinitely. About 10 days later, working with Maxis at the Kino facility, Sophia reveals she was attacked by Subject 26. Now just a day later, on February 14, 1943, having learned Sophia was attacked by Subject 26, Maxis kills her and transfers her brain into a machine. The machine is known as Strategic Operations Planning Heuristic Intelligence Analyzer, also known as Sophia. Now on July 7, 1943, Sophia is transferred to Stalingrad to oversee Group 935's operations. On September the 2nd, Harvey Vienna reports the dragons have proven beneficial to the war effort at Stalingrad. He confirms that Diglock research continues to explore time displacement and movements across dimensions. On November the 6th, two months later, Sophia confirms the existence of Project Rasputin, the Russian Mangler soldier. On January 11, 1944, Sophia confirms the Russian Gigant robot has set back the German advance. Fast forward to April 14, 1945, Sophia declares the Battle of Stalingrad is nearing victory for German forces and that Valkyrie drones have been deployed to locate any resistance strains and attempt capture. After the release of large concentrations of Element 115 by German forces, the city becomes largely populated by the undead. Nikolai and his comrades continue to fight for what remains of Stalingrad. Now, a few months later, on September the 2nd, 1945, World War II still rages on. Stalingrad is turning to a three-way conflict between Dragon, Machine, and the Undead. Without any remaining human survivors, Sophia is now trapped in the city. And just two months later, November the 6th, drifting through time and space in his ethereal form, Gersh arrives in the Fracture. And on the exact same day, Primus arrives, frees Sophia, and acquires Ultimus Nikolai's soul. Richtofen then teleports the souls of Dempsey, Takio, and Nikolai to Maxis at the house, and Dr. Monty then announces his existence to Primus for the very first time here at Gurat Krovi. Now on April 25th, 1956, 11 years later, while traveling to Shangri-La, Brock and Gary's plane crashes in the mountains as a result of a freak atmospheric event. Another side effect of the temporal rifts created as a result of the Angonia Fracture's creation. Now on November the 6th, 1963, a couple years later, hiding in a closet at the Pentagon, McNamara records a message confirming that John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, and Fidel Castro have died as a result of a zombie outbreak, he dies moments later. Now moving on to Dimension 63, we have February 18, 1300, Pablo begins documenting the Great War, including all he has learned about the Keepers, Apothecans, and Element 115. Regarding Element 115's power, he notes that a site in northern France contains massive deposits of the element. 
This is the event that differentiated Dimension 63 from the original Dimension. So on June 4th, 1300, in northern France, a tomb was constructed to honor the fallen soldiers of the Great War. Within it, statues of Primus are constructed to symbolize the hope that if one day a great evil falls upon mankind, they may return. Now on July 17th, 1898, Edward Richthofen's parents die, and on February 20th, 1905, a couple of years later, Takeo Masaki fights in the Battle of Mukden. Now on August 11th, 1906, Richthofen begins his studies at Heidelberg University under the tutelage of Dr. Maxis. Having lost his parents, Richthofen comes to view him as a father figure. Six years later, Maxis convinces Richthofen to join Group 935 with him, an organization set up by mysterious founders for the express benefit of Germany with possible ties to the Bavarian Illuminati. Now on June 4th, 1914, Richthofen is visited by another version of himself, handing him some blood vials and he explains, you will need this blood, when the time comes it will protect you, before stepping back into the rift he came from. Now a year later, Maxis invents the Mauser prototype on January 5th, 1915. A year after that, August 25th, 1916, the Journal of Sir Pablo Marinus, Knight of the Great War, is discovered by Group 935. A year later, March 23rd, 1917, using information gathered from Pablo's journal, Group 935 begins work at a dig site in northern France where they discover a series of underground tombs. Now on April 21st, Group 935 discovers what appears to be the entrance to the tomb's main chamber. They struggle to gain access. Now a month later, on May 11th, unable to gain access to the main chamber, soldiers listen to a gramophone to alleviate their frustration. When listening to a recording of La Source Noire, the entrance to the main chamber unexpectedly opens. The camp's exposure to Element 115 does begin. Now about 10 days later, using information from Pablo's journal and the tomb's main chamber, Maxis draws schematics for the creation of four elemental staves and instructs Richthofen to begin their construction. Now on May 29th, the more Maxis reads of the Great War, the more he begins to question his understanding of the scientific world and the true nature of the universe itself. He finds himself open to the possibility of a higher power. Now on June 11, 1917, as Group 935 experiments with Element 115, they successfully create localized energy fields which appear to function as portals. Noting that objects can pass through them, Maxis speculates that the rifts may have opened gateways across space and time. The rifts allow Samantha to reach out to Maxis from Agartha. She begs for his help and ultimately reveals she is his daughter. Now on June 15th, an ancient box with the power to manifest weapons from different eras arrives through a portal. Maxis fears that LN-115 is disrupting the space-time continuum. On July 1st, following the installation of 115 power generators, reports surfaced regarding ancient figures emerging from the dig site. Corresponding with the mysterious deaths of a number of 935 soldiers, the ancient figures are undead knights from the Great War. Now on August 3rd, a month later, Nikolai Belinsky is sent into exile. On September the 10th, using 115, Group 935 construct a fleet of giant automations, three of which are Freya, Odin, and Thor. With this, they vastly outmatch the technology of the Allies. On September the 22nd, Richthofen notes that in spite of Group 935's progress at the dig site, he is troubled by Maxis's growing obsession with Pablo's diary. On October 6th, Takeo Masaki is dispatched to France by the Emperor to gather intel on Group 935's weapon technology. On October 17th, Wall Street goes into the panic as the stocks crash. On November 19th, following reports of prototype armed weaponry, strange lights in the sky, a mysterious plague, and even giant metal men, Tank Dempsey is deployed in northern France to assess the extent of Group 935's capabilities. About a month later, December the 10th, already exiled in Europe, Nikolai receives new orders from the Imperial Russian Army to investigate the enemy war machine. Still loyal to the motherland, he willingly goes ahead. And on February 23rd, Nikolai writes of the ongoing civil war in his homeland. He does not expect peace to last long, but he is enjoying his time in France. A month later, learning that the Emperor wishes to meet him to discuss a matter of great importance to our nation, Takeo writes that he feels a growing sense of dread in the wake of his recent dark, twisted dreams. 
A month after that, April 14th, despite ongoing battles, Dempsey fares well in northern France. In a personal letter, he reveals that both the Japanese and Russian armies have also sent spies to investigate the activities of Group 935. On May 1st, 1918, Maxis is obsessed with the voice of Samantha, who now speaks to him constantly. He believes her to be the key to everything. Twelve days later, believing that his mentor has been affected by 115 like others at the dick site, Richthofen reports Max's erratic behavior to Group 935's senior staff. The next day, Richthofen learns from Pablo's journal that Northern France dick site may be the single largest deposit of 115 on the earth. He believes this explains why it has affected so many at the site. And the next day, now completely consumed by Samantha's voice, Maxis swears he will no longer serve Group 935's mission. Now on June 4th, 1918, we have Origins. So Element 115 awakens the undead knights from the Great War and quickly consumes the camp. Maxis is rendered catatonic by the element and Richtofen removes his brain before he turns. Dempsey, Nikolai, and Takio unite with Richtofen on the battlefield and help free Samantha from her imprisonment in Agartha. Primus has been reunited, and Samantha sends Primus to their next destination, the original dimension, 1943, with the intention of stopping the events that brought her to this point. Maxis's brain arrives in Agartha, and Dr. Monty decides to step in. Monty brings Maxis's brain to the house and wipes the Maxis corrupted by Dark Aether from existence. Now, on July 18th, 1922, four years later, Salvador Sal de Luca opens gambling houses across Chicago. This marks the beginning of the De Luca crime family. On February 17th, 1923, Billy Handsome joins the De Luca crime family as a hitman. Sal will come to look as Billy as the son he never had. Now, September the 18th, a few months later, an expert in gambling and rigging sporting events, Michael Finn O'Leary, begins working for Sal. Now, on March 23rd, 1924, Finn marries Angelina Bow, an inspiring starlet with the delusions of grandeur. Now, about five years later, on March 1st, 1929, Sal writes of his frustrations with Chicago's finest. After many years of successful bribes with the city, it becomes clear that it is no longer an option. Now, on May 11, 1930, a year later, Sal begins to work with Albert Al Arlington, an associate in Los Angeles known for being a master schemer and bank robber. Now, October the 14th, 1930, Finn informs his lawyers he will not accept divorce from Angela, saying she can leave this marriage the day she leaves this earth. Now, on October the 11th, 1931, after an LA heist where Sal goes wrong, Al wakes up in the hospital. Now, two weeks later, while in the hospital, Al submits Icarus from Mars for publication as a comic strip. It is his third attempt and it is yet again denied. Now, November the 11th, angry and frustrated with this collapsing empire, Sal kills a prostitute. No longer willing to turn a blind eye, Chicago PD arrests him. Now, December the 1st, in an operation against the Luca crime family, Billy is then arrested for multiple homicides. About two weeks later, in an operation against the Luca crime family, Finn is arrested by Chicago PD when his wife offers evidence against him. On January 19th, 1930, Al is arrested for his role in the LA heist, and on May 14th, Sal is found guilty of murder and he is sentenced to life in prison at Alcatraz. Two days later, Billy is found guilty of 116 counts of murder and he is sentenced to life in prison at Alcatraz as well. And about two weeks later after that, Finn is then found guilty of 16 counts of gambling fraud, and he will serve his sentence at Alcatraz as well. Now, sometime before June 13, 1932, Alcatraz Island opens a year early, and the warden celebrates while the Illuminati begins operations on the island while taking the warden into their protection for reasons unknown to him. Sometime later, the warden bemoans his inability to contact the biblical Satan, of whom he is an avid worshipper of. The Illuminati, knowing far more than the Warden, finds his methods laughable. Now, on June 13, 1932, Sal and Billy arrive at Alcatraz Island, and about a week and a half later, Finn then arrives at Alcatraz, and on July 1st, 1932, Al is then found guilty of grand larceny, grand theft auto, arson, conspiracy, and battery. He will serve his sentence at Alcatraz as well. Al then arrives at Alcatraz on August 3rd, 1932. Now, on January 15th, 1933, Three, Stanley Ferguson begins working at Alcatraz Island. Now, on April 1st, Al convinces Sal, Finn, and Billy that they could build a plane and escape Alcatraz. But on December 2nd, realizing the plane will never be completed and embittered with rage, Sal, Finn, and Billy plot to get revenge on Al. 
On December 31st, Finn, Sal, and Billy lure Al to the roof and kill him. On the same day, eventually making contact with the Shadow Man, the Warden is told to sacrifice the souls of four prisoners, Sal DeLuca, Billy Hansom, Finn O'Leary, and Albert Arlington, and bind them to his body by taking his own life. This will serve a similar purpose to that of the Elemental Shard, in that the Warden's body will serve as the anchor for the Alcatraz Pocket Dimension, with the souls of the mobsters making up the fabric of it. The Shadow Man tells him that this purgatory is a trap, and will eventually ensnare four men, led by Edward Richtofen. Now on January 11, 1934, stepping through a rift, Richtofen secures the blood samples of Sal and Finn. And on January 19th, about a week later, found guilty of Al's murder, Sal, Finn, and Billy are executed by electric chair. On January 19th as well, the Warden kills himself via electric chair, creating the Alcatraz pocket dimension and trapping the mobsters in an endless cycle. Now we have Ma with the dead. Sal, Finn, Billy, and Al battle waves of the undead as they find themselves trapped in a seemingly endless cycle. So long as the cycle is kept up, any being within the dimension is outside the power of Dr. Monty. Furthermore, any being that consumes biological material of an entry within the pocket also gains a similar level of immunity to Monty's power. Now, on April 16th, 1940, Richtofen arrives at Dimension 63, where he contacts members of the Illuminati and enlists their help to build a laboratory facility beneath Alcatraz. The Illuminati are already well aware of Richtofen and his intentions. Now, two days later, we have Richtofen who meets with Stanley Ferguson and convinces him to assist with the Illuminati's construction of the underground Alcatraz laboratory. On July 3rd, 1941, Stanley Ferguson reports that the laboratory has been completed and the subjects will be placed in the stasis chambers upon arrival. Now on July 4, just a day later, Richtofen returns to the lab under Alcatraz where he meets Victus, arriving from the empty earth with the Cronorium. Upon reading the Cronorium, Richtofen discovers numerous timelines documenting their fates and learns about the blood vials. He will later write on the page, I know now what I must do, and Richtofen enters a rift to acquire the blood of Sal and Finn. After delivering the blood to his younger self and recovering the blood vials belonging to Victus, he returns. Victus is placed on ice to be kept safe until they are needed next. Now also on July 4th, we have Primus who arrives to collect the Victus blood samples from this Richtofen. Following Primus's departure, Richtofen learns the location of the summoning key and travels to his next destination. On October 1st, 1942, Stanley Ferguson leaves employment at Alcatraz. And about a year later, on October 21st, 1943, posing as Mr. Rapp, the Shadow Man hires Dimension 63's version of the reporter to recover artifacts from the South Pacific and even Russia. On November 5th, Nero's wife signs a loan agreement in his name. Meanwhile, Nero is currently in a coma after his performance of the Amphibious Man. On December 14th, the reporter recovers the artifacts from the South Pacific and Russia. Among them is the Summoning Key. On December 25th, about a week later, as per Mr. Rapp's request, the reporter speaks to Stanley Ferguson, a retired guard from Alcatraz. Stanley gives detailed accounts of the deaths of Al Arlington, Billy Handsome, Finn O'Leary, and Sal DeLuca. Now, a couple days later, on December 31st, at Mr. Rapp's request, the reporter arrives in Morgue City to take in its sights, sounds, and smells. On January 15th, 1944, a meteor shower rains over Morgue City. About a week later, the reporter notes strange mold now growing all over the city, and he also notes people are getting sick and acting delirious. On February 13, 1944, a fruit vendor tells the reporter about the ancient order of the keepers and how they're the only ones holding back the forces of the apocalypse. He talks of people hearing chanting from beneath the city. On March 30th, the reporter sends Mr. Rapp a telegram providing details and contact information for Nero, Jessica Rose, Floyd Campbell, and Jack Vincent. On April 5th, 1944, aware of the Shadow Man's actions, Monty writes to the reporter, warning him not to give the summoning key to anyone. Now about five days later, Jessica Rose learns a photographer is in possession of compromising pictures of her. 
On April 20th, 10 days later, pretending to be a company executive, the shadow man tells Nero's lawyer that Nero's wife has taken out substantial loans in his name. Nero has 15 days to settle before the company seeks reparation, and facing multiple deaths due to his wife's spending habits, Nero decides to kill his wife and use her life insurance to pay off the debt. On the same day, masquerading as an internal affairs officer, the shadow man tries to convince Jackie Vincent's partner to admit that Jack is on the take. Upon learning that internal affairs is snooping around, Jack plots to kill the snitch who could provide evidence against him. Now on the same day as well, the shadow man poses as a film director interested in hiring Jessica for a leading role. He tells her producer that part is hers. Afraid that the photographer could jeopardize her chance at stardom, she asks him to meet her so they can sort stuff out. Now later on, posing as a journalist as well, the shadow man suggests that Floyd Campbell is a journeyman fighter to Floyd's promoter. Wanting to guarantee his shot at the title, Floyd decides to wear brass knuckles under his gloves for his fight with Tony King. Later on as well, Jessica kills the photographer and secures the incriminating photo. Photographs. Jack then kills the snitch who could turn him over to internal affairs. Floyd kills Tony King in the boxing match and cashes in on his winnings. Nero then kills his wife in a work accident, cashing in her life insurance to square away the debts. Richthofen then arrives in Mork City to secure the summoning key. Now on April 22nd, 1944, Richthofen learns the reporter has a summoning key and confronts him. The reporter waves Monty's letter at Richthofen and orders him to stay away before attacking him. Richthofen kills the reporter in self-defense and Richthofen is unable to acquire the summoning key thanks to the keeper inscription on its box, providing it with unnatural protection. Now on April 25th, 1944, we have Shadows of Evil, so Nero, Jack, Floyd, and Jessica are not unconscious at the Black Lace Burlesque Club. They wake up in a twisted version of Morgue City, shifted slightly from reality. Told they can atone for their sins by the Shadow Man, all four are tricked into performing rituals. Jessica sacrifices her producer, Jack gets his partner, Floyd gets his promoter, and Nero sacrifices his lawyer. Completing the required rituals, the four acquire gateworms physical beings that are capable of storing life force. They use these in order to smash open an ancient artifact known as the Apothecan Riftstone, granting the Apothecans are given access to Dimension 63. Realizing they've been duped, the four work with the Keepers to defeat the Shadow Man and they trap him inside the Summoning Key. Before they can hand it over to the Keepers, Primus Richtofen arrives and steals the key, dooming every living being in this entire dimension to certain death. Richtofen travels to Dimensions 2210 to secure an innocent Richtofen soul. He delivers the soul to the house. From within the summoning key, the Shadow Man states, I'll be seeing you. The next day, the Apothecans destroy Dimension 63. Now moving on to Agartha, the first arrival. With Dr. Monty's help, the Maxis drone arrives at the house in Agartha. Despite the absence of his soul, Monty recreates a physical manifestation of his Dimension 63 form. We now have the arrival of Samantha. Monty brings Samantha to the house, reuniting her with the Dimension 63 incarnation of her father. Samantha's corruption then takes place. Knowing that Samantha's corrupted by the Dark Aether, Monty takes her away from Maxis and the house. We have the isolation of Maxis. Alone in the house and missing his daughter, Maxis wonders if Richtofen will have the courage to fulfill the vow he made all those years ago. We then have the rediscovery of the empty earth. Having observed Monty for some time, Maxis uses the teleporter in the basement of the house to study and explore other dimensions. Among them is the empty earth where an alternate Maxis had constructed Zero Base, a facility that houses artifacts and replicas collected from a multitude of different timelines. However, his attempts to manipulate the empty earth creates a reality too fragile to be sustained. We then have the restoration of innocence. When Monty returns Samantha to Maxis, her innocence is restored. Monty's plan is where Monty explains to Maxis that the paradox routes by a multiverse must be resolved. A new reality can be created, one free of apothecans, but only if they enlist the aid of souls who had lived through and survived the fracturing itself. We then have the Cronorium secured. Among the artifacts that Maxis collected in Zero Base is an ancient book known as the Cronorium, a complete chronicle of the entire history and future of all reality. Protected by various countermeasures, the facility can only be accessed by those possessing a soul. Now this is where Richtofen's journey begins. Maxis tells Richtofen the plan to secure the Cronorium and locate the summoning key. Hearing the echoes of his other selves, Richtofen discovers his connection 
conversation with Samuel Sulinger and decides to use Victus to acquire the Cronorium. Now we have the manipulation of Stulinger, where having overseen the construction of a laboratory beneath Alcatraz, Richtofen returns to the house where he begins to communicate with Stulinger. Together, they persuade Victus to travel to a variety of locations in order to recover the Cronorium. Upon arriving at Zero Base, Victus provides blood samples that allow them to access the empty earth and recover the Cronorium. Richtofen then collects the Victus blood samples from undead Richtofen. Richtofen collects Eddie's innocent soul from Dimension 2210 and Monty gives him a physical form inside of the house. Eddie and Samantha meet each other for the first time, and Samantha writes in her diary that Edward doesn't like to share toys. Monty brings Eddie and Samantha more toys. Maxis then notes that the teleportation and travel between dimensions could have a profound impact on the mind. He fears that the confusion caused by the collision of memories past, present, and future could lead to the collapse of reality itself. The souls then arrive. Maxis tells Samantha and Eddie to put the toys away and to make sure the windows are locked before they come down to the basement. As each soul arrives, Monty transforms them into their younger selves and returns their innocence. Now with the arrival of Primus, soulless Primus that is, Primus brings a summoning key to the house where Maxis unwittingly releases the Shadow Man, who in turn frees the Apothecans from the Dark Aether. Unaware that they will be wiped from existence once they have served their purpose, Primus battles alongside Monty in his final battle against the Shadow Man. Now on Revelations, Primus is told by both Monty and the Shadow Man that at one point in time, both Monty and the Shadow Man were one until they split apart and it's up to Primus to decide who they want to side with during the cycle and ultimately during every iteration of the cycle Primus ends up siding with Dr. Monty so it appears to be some type of battle between light versus darkness but it's actually not that simple the lines are blurred between light and darkness good and evil Dr. Monty nor the shadow man are good or evil neither can be defined as light or darkness but together they can be defined as light and darkness as Monty describes here on Revelations they are two parts of the same worm, but which one is the S? Although somewhat different from one another, they lack defining features. Monty and the Shadow Man are more similar than many people actually know. Both were actually corrupted by the Dark Aether, the Shadow Man by his own ambition, but Monty was corrupted by desperately trying to save his friend, the Shadow Man. Both never wanted to be ripped apart by the Dark Aether and craved to be one again by resolving their duality. However, on Revelations and throughout the cycle, we end up assisting Dr. Monty in ensuring that all the Apothecans are vanquished so that the only thing that is left to exist is the house in this perfect world which resides in Agartha. Now in case you guys are still confused on the difference between Agartha, the Aether, and the Dark Aether, here's the explanation in simple terms. Agartha is the light version of reality, the place above creation, heaven so to speak, where Dr. Monty and the Keepers reside as they keep themselves as the protectors of reality. The Aether is all of reality, the entire multiverse, the middle of creation, and the Dark Aether there is the shadow, the dark version of reality below creation, corrupted and damned to eternal suffering. This is where the Apothecans were banished. Now a good way to visualize that in simple terms is that Agartha is the perfect world represented by heaven and beauty, free of all evil. The ether could just be the earth, the universe and all its inhabitants, all possessing ethereal energy. The more that one may time travel, the more ethereal energy they may accumulate, causing severe fracture and fragments crumbling through through the ether, and the dark ether can simply be looked at as hell. And we actually see the dark ether in a visual format for the first time in the D Machina reveal trailer. Since the dark ether is simply a demented version of reality, the map seems to be exactly the same, however, a bit tormented, forever changed, and forever corrupted. Now, at the end of the cycle, as usual, Primus defeats the Shadow Man, vanquishes all Apothecans, and collapses the multiverse to ensure that Monty's perfect world, or Agartha, is now cleansed of all evil and is the only universe left standing. Monty then discovers that Primus actually consumed the souls from dimensions that no longer exist, thus creating a paradox. This paradox ensures that the cycle can continue to repeat itself over and over again, to where at the end of Revelations, Monty sends Primus back in time to the Great War to assist the Keepers. They then pass on and are reborn for the events of Origins to take place, so 
on and so forth. Rinse and repeat, the cycle continues. Now Treyarch wasn't gonna stop there. They weren't gonna leave us hanging with just the cycle with no actual conclusion. So to make sure that one day they could give us a fresh take on Call of Duty Zombies, they first went ahead and tied up some loose ends with what we call the Broken Cycle. So on July 4th, 1941, in Dimension 63 slash Purgatory, we have Blood of the Dead. So on a detour in their journey between Japan and Stalingrad, Primus travels to Alcatraz just after Victus had been sealed into cryostasis. However, something is very wrong. Richthofen notes the dimensional insertion is slightly off, indicating something has changed. Having to travel physically through the prison to the lab, they meet up with the next cycle's Richthofen, intently studying the Cronorium far more than the current Richthofen remembers doing himself. He hands Primus their blood vials, but before leaving, says to the prior iteration of himself that he ought to read the Cronorium again. It is at this moment that Richthofen makes a revelation that shatters his world. The vials of his blood, all of the blood, no longer function as Alcatraz is no longer a continuum. Albert Arlington did the impossible. He did what Richthofen was always unable to do and broke his cycle with this, ironically, breaking Primus's cycle in turn. Whilst this was Richthofen's ultimate goal with this flawed blood plan, he is horrified by the fate that the book has assigned to him for he will have to finally make the ultimate sacrifice. As they attempt to escape the island, the Warden of Alcatraz, now no longer preoccupied with the mobsters, seals their only exit rift. Worried as to the whereabouts of his friend, Max's attempts to establish communications with Richthofen. He knows that Richthofen is likely trapped in the Alcatraz pocket dimension and that, as a result of his dimensional cataloging, he had become aware of Richthofen's secret dealings on the island. However, he had kept the secret from Monty for the sake of his friend. Maxis explains to Richthofen that he has discovered the biological tissue serves as a conduit for ethereal energy. When one passes through a rift, their cells become infused with the ether, and as Richthofen has done this more than anyone else, his blood may be able to literally punch a hole in the dimension to allow them to escape, however it may be incredibly dangerous. Unbeknownst to Maxis, a device was constructed on the island by an unknown individual with an immense intellect on the orders of the Shadow Man for this exact purpose. Guided by Icarus, the spirit of Albert Arlington, Primus manipulate the Warden's corpse, the vessel that binds the dimension together, and use this to weaken the dimension to a significant enough degree so that they can use Richthofen's blood to escape. However, in this final crucial moment, they are captured by the Warden. Not realizing he is simply a pawn for the Shadow Man, the Warden believes he must use the blood of Primus to maintain an open portal to the Dark Aether to allow what he believes are the hordes of Hell to wreak havoc upon the Earth. Aided by the spirits of Sal, Billy, Finn, and Al, Primus escape their cells and confront the Warden for a final time. Richthofen, having read the Cronorium, is unwilling to truly acknowledge what comes next. However, he engages the dethawing process on the fifth cryopod, containing the version of himself from the Great War. At the climax of the battle, Richthofen enters a dark mechanism to begin the generation of the escape portals, believing the alternate version of himself will be able to save him. Arriving just in time, the Richthofen from the Great War uses the elemental gem of fire to bathe the island in a cleansing light, finally allowing the many of hundreds of tormented souls, including the mobsters, to rest. Richthofen, still suffering in the dark mechanism, with his blood being painfully extracted and processed, is given a glimpse at hope when he lays eyes upon his other self before it is destroyed. The Great War Richthofen smashed the blood vials of the good doctor and explains that the cycle is broken. He says he's not sorry as he is fully aware of his own egotism surrounding the blood vials, and through his friendship with Pablo, now understands the misery and sacrifice that his egotism has caused. Just as fractures rewrite the past, this event cannot occur logically and there cannot be two Richthofens coexisting in this manner. And so the memories of Primus are rewritten to them, this martyred Richthofen never existed. The Great War Richthofen has Nikolai the Cronorium. Having fought with Nikolai for eight years, he knows out of everyone, he has the greatest force of will and has conquered his inner demons in the past. He would be their guiding hand. Within the Cronorium, Nikolai learns of a device theorized but never completed by the first race and highly coveted by the Apothecans and Keepers dubbed the Agarthan device. This artifact, once constructed, is capable of manifesting an individual's will into reality, essentially granting wishes, as well as indicated by its inscription, its additional function is to resolve the duality that has plagued the existence since the disappearance of the first one. 
on November the 5th, 1963, in the original timeline, we have classified. So Primus arrives at Groom Lake, recruiting the now reunited Ultimus to join in a fighting of the Great War to defeat Dr. Monty. Now sometime between July 6, 2025 and September the 2nd, 2025, in the original timeline, we have Alpha Omega. So arriving at Broken Arrow's Camp Edward at some point in 2025, Prior to the rockets impacting the Earth, Primus and Ultimus set out to find the Elemental Shard. Eventually gaining the trust of the base AI, Rushmore, Primus and Ultimus defeat Purnell, now calling himself Avogadro, and recover the Elemental Shard. Whilst this occurs, Max's attempts to make contact with Richtofen, explaining that Monty is becoming incredibly anxious, as it should have already reached Stalingrad by now. Coming to understand what Richtofen was planning, Max feels he has no choice but to get Samantha and Eddie out of the house, for fear of what Monty may do to them. As he locks them within the teleporter and activates the machine, Monty murders Maxis. This event undoes his purification of Samantha. Now sometime before Tagger Toten, Pablo Marinus awakens to find the Siberian facility overrun by the undead. Every time he attempts to escape, he is pulled back towards the lighthouse. Now sometime after January 1st, 1964, in the original timeline, we have Tagger Toten as well. Arriving in the forest, Primus Nikolai and Ultimus Richtofen, now the de facto leaders of the group, thanks to their combined knowledge, understand what must be done. The group begins to celebrate their journey's end, whilst Nikolai takes Samantha aside, explaining that when the time comes, she is the only one who will be able to end this madness once and for all. Victus awaken within Richtofen's lab, making contact with his old friend for the last time. Ultimus Richtofen instructs Samuel that they must do one last thing for him, construct the Agarthan device. Leaving through a rift, Victus arrive at what seems to be the Siberian facility. However, just as with Alcatraz and Mork City, this location has been extracted from its proper place and shifted somewhere else. Victus reached the lighthouse and encountered Pablo, the Mexican test subject, who had many years prior died at this site. Within the forest, Primus and Ultimus recount their exploits to one another, their hopes, their dreams, and all of their follies and victories. Nikolai explains that with the Agarthan device, they will all finally be granted the peace they deserve. As all but their leader drink and enjoy the merriment, Ultimus Richtofen is aware of a dark truth and one he enables no less. These will be their last moments. Ultimus Richtofen plays the role he knows he must, and thanks to the meddling of Maxis so long ago, survives past death, returning to his true rotten form. Victus, with the guidance of Primus Nikolai and Ultimus Richtofen, travel to the heart of the facility where Ultimus were forged. Acquiring the Seal of Duality, hidden there by Richtofen years ago, they are sent the Elemental Shard by Nikolai. Now only one piece remains, the blood of the Apothecans. Communicating with the blood, they learn it is saddened and despairing. The once arrogant and primally powerful race have been humbled, even swallowing their ancient pride and speaking in the language their betrayers had created to replace the language of the first one. Returning the scattered elements of the blood, the blood submits to Victus, admitting that the duality must be resolved. The Vessel of the Keepers, the Blood of the Apothecans, the Aether that binds them. Using the machines of Jeb Brown's divinely inspired design, Victus fully powers the device, causing it to begin its final evolution. Due to the nature of the device, this also begins to imperably alter all 115 around it due to the device now integrating the entire Aether, this transformation violently scorching the realm around it, eventually reaching its final perfect state. With a duality that had plagued existence for so long and claimed the lives of so many now final resolved, it was time for Victus to fulfill their final purpose. A chain of events must be set in motion. One final paradox to cement the breaking of the cycle. Handing the seal of duality to Pablo, he opens a portal and brings himself to where his destiny requires. He will become Sir Pablo Marinus, once and a future hero of the Great War. He would be set upon by the Apothecan Horde and saved by Primus. He would help one of the men who saved him realize that the sacrifice of so many lives for an endless loop was not worth it and that it must end. He would give his final moments protecting that man so he may be sent forward and eventually help break the cycle. He would help to bring about the end of existence and he would help birth it anew. Collecting the Agarthan device left by Pablo, Victus transported to the forest where Primus Nikolai and Ultimus Richtofen await the end. To the keepers, the word seal means lock, and that is the device's final purpose. 
the summoning key is used on the lock of duality, causing the infinite imbued within the summoning key by the first one to explode out and the ether in the form of the elemental shard to shrivel away. Nikolai grants Richtofen his final death and, knowing the ether and its sentience, would attempt to keep him alive and bring about the cycle once more, has Samantha fulfill her vow to end the one that would otherwise perpetuate the infinite himself. All that remains is banished back into the Dark Aether in the hopes that it may never return again, harming anyone. With Victus having to make the ultimate sacrifice, their lives tied as much to the survival of the Aether as any other. Cycle broken, duality resolved, Samantha and Eddie are granted their way through to a universe unburdened by the corruption brought by the Aether since the first moments of existence. Tightly holding each other by the hand, they step forward into a new world. And now that the duality is resolved and the first one is whole again, Dark and Light are bound back together as Monty and the Shadow Man always wanted. But with with that, you now know everything that one could know with the Aether storyline, which is perfect preparation for the beginning of the Dark Aether storyline. So, where we lift off in Black Ops Cold War is in the new rebooted universe. No longer a multiverse, but just one linear timeline, free from corruption. There's no more Element 115, no more Summoning Key, no more Apothecary and Keeper influence, and no more Undead for now. As part of Requiem, a CIA-backed international response team led by Gregory Weaver, operatives explore a World War II bunker ravaged by time and covered in graffiti. Nocturne and Toten returns part of the new map, De Machina. Transform into a nuclear testing facility amidst the Cold War, a Soviet-led division and rival to Requiem, the Omega Group, also has a keen interest in studying and harnessing the power that lies within. We are hinted that Dimashina takes place in Moscow, Poland, the location of a meteor crash site that surely has some important significance. Dark experiments are taking place. A machine appears to rip a hole into the dark ether, causing the corruption to start bleeding out into the once thought to be safe universe. An isolated undead outbreak takes place at the facility, and Samantha, now grown to a young adult, informs Weaver of the outbreak via telephone, and they send a team to investigate. An unknown member is seen to be spying on her as she does so. Could this be a member of the Omega group, or maybe even the grown-up version of Eddie? Samantha types the character's Maxis into the phone's keypad. Could this simply be an easter egg for her last name, or could there be further meaning that her father, Ludwig Maxis, is somehow alive too in this rebooted universe? The Dark Aether brings mutated elements of the past back into Black Ops Cold War, such as a demented hybrid of Brutus fused with the Panzer Soldat, the Origin Shield, and the Russian Mangler. We also have a Nova Crawler fused with a Hellhound, and keep note, they look similar to Keepers and Apothecans due to Nova Crawlers already being a failed attempt at creating the Vrilia, or the Keepers, by experimenting with 115, Nova 6, pig and human DNA. We also have a broken version of the Pack-a-Punch machine that looks to have been fixed by some sort of device. And returning perks, now upgradable, such as Juggernaut and Speed Cola. It's also worth noting that Ultimus and Primus are gone forever, but Victus were banished into the Dark Aether, so maybe they could merge with other things from the past, or the fact they're in there could open up the possibility for a potential Dark Aether corrupted remake of the Victus maps. Maybe even Stoolinger has some way of communicating with Eddie, like before. After all, it appears as though we can physically track into the Dark Aether on the Machina, which seems to be just a corrupted version of reality with weird spores, jellyfish, and other strange stuff. We have that neon dark lighting as well. Could Victus not be in there somewhere despite their story being over? In Black Ops Cold War Zombies, we'll be able to play as operators featuring familiar campaign characters such as Frank Woods and Adler. We will be seeing an additional map, Firebase Z, set in Vietnam, or maybe we can get an explanation for the Frank Woods 115 tattoo. The graffiti on the Machina appears to be ethereal, as with in them are such things like Brutus, the Cosmic Silverback, Blue and Pink Bunnies, and a demon-like creature that could potentially be the new antagonist, maybe the first one. Speaking of the one written on the staircase reads, the accursed one will rise again, suggesting that the one is trying to break free from the Dark Aether into this new universe, and maybe it is what's controlling the zombies, or alternatively, Sam and Eddie could have something to do with it as well. Although both their souls were cleansed, writing on the map reads, I see her in the woods. Could the frozen forest be Nocturne Toten? 
There is also writing that looks like see her in something, stalking in the dark, and on the plane wing, something wrath is coming. Maybe remnants of her corrupt self remain within the dark ether. After all, her teddy bear has been replaced with her toy rabbit in the mystery box, and the zombie's eyes are yellow. Maybe the one is trying to corrupt her again and trying to get her to help it, or another version of herself exists somehow in this dark ether. A creepy girl can be heard laughing in Warzone as well, and both Eddie and Sam possess ethereal energy since they have traveled to this new universe and have ties to their old selves. Sam seemingly remembers the past that she stated it's happening again upon hearing of the outbreak. A World Not My Own is also written, a callback to the ether is not for us, someone or something doesn't want us here. So with all that being said, that is everything you need to know about the ether storyline in time for Black Ops Cold War. Huge special thanks to the Gaming Revolution, and if you're watching this on his channel, then my link is also in his description as well. Huge shout out to also Eric Maynard and Cal Jitsu for assisting with this 90 page script based off an updated timeline from the COD Zombies forums. Their links are also down below in the description too. In in addition, I'd like to give a big thank you to TZ Ghost for his awesome animations that were used in parts of this video to better visualize what was being discussed. All of their links will be in the description as well. We will be making an updated timeline once all of Black Ops Cold War Zombies maps are out, including any relevant info from the campaign for that game. Since the campaign does have multiple endings, maybe one of those endings will tie into the D Machina story. So with all that being said, that is everything you need to know about the Ether storyline in time for Black Ops Cold War. I'd like to thank the Gaming Revolution, his link is down below in the description, for turning a 90 page script into a dual commentary with me. And if you're watching this on his channel, my link will be in his description as well. And also a huge special thank you to both Eric Maynard and Cal Jitsu for assisting with writing the script based off an updated timeline from the COD Zombies forums. All their links are of course down below in the description. And in addition, I'd like to give a big thank you to TZ Ghost for his awesome animations that were used in parts of this video to better visualize things that were being discussed and things that we just didn't get to see in actual zombies maps or cutscenes. To conclude, I'd like to give a massive thank you to all the legends over at Treyarch and Raven who have worked on zombies over the years and for providing the world with years of memories and joy through ups and downs. Thank you for everything. With that being said, I'd like to give one last thank you to everybody out there who tuned into this video and we'll see you guys in Black Ops Cold War. Peace.